I welcome uh, all the audience uh, uh, attending this uh, virtual event, uh, which is a virtual colloquium. Uh, the acronym is TEC, Materials and Technologies uh, for Solar and Thermal to Electric Energy Conversion. This is uh, the, the, the first event. This is, this is uh, uh, an event that predates uh, the, the next conference in uh, Sardinia in July, uh, 2021, and uh, I thank, I start thanking uh, all the organization for, uh, for supporting uh, this uh, uh, event, uh, starting from the other chairman, I'm Daniele Trucchi, uh, I thank the other chairman, Gaspare Barbaro uh, of the CNR, Italian CNR, I thank the scientific committee uh, of the event, uh, uh, which even individuated the, the very high level speakers of uh, today. And I obviously, above all, uh, thank uh, all the speakers, uh, which will give us uh, uh, their vision about uh, uh, the materials and technologies uh, uh, for converting uh, thermal and solar energy into electric. Hi, Andre. Hi, uh, uh, dear all. Okay. Let's start. Uh, I I start uh, sharing the screen in order to. Uh... Okay. Okay. So, let this uh, this event uh, uh, is. Uh, uh, particularly interesting because there's a growing interest uh, in materials and technologies for for such applications. Which applications? The driving uh, application of the, 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 the last uh, few years uh, is concentrated solar power, in which uh, uh, which now it is a sector using uh, technologies which are related to thermodynamic engines and uh, mechanical engines, which uh, uh, got, uh, um, are uh, reliable, but uh, they need to, to be renewed in order to, to, to give uh, another, uh, other opportunities for uh, other uh, conversion technologies. Um, Considering solar power is uh, uh, decreasing during the, 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 the last year, and probably uh, it is due to the uh, lack of uh, introduction of uh, new technologies. And uh, okay, this, this uh, uh, virtual colloquium uh, has got the, uh, the aim to try to understand uh, which are the technologies that can renew this kind of uh, driving application. The other driving application is the, which is growing during the, 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 uh, the last year or uh, two years is the, high temperature energy storage from renewables and non-renewables. I have taken this uh, very uh, insightful uh, graph from a picture from, uh, from a paper uh, from uh, Caleb in which uh, it is recognized that the cheapest way to store energy is uh, at high temperature by making uh, uh, possible and uh, a process uh, in which electricity produced by renewables and non-renewables is uh, transformed into it, so a hot fluid, and then retransformed into electric energy in order to, to support the, the future, for example, electrical transportation, uh, which is uh, increasingly uh, growing. The other application of uh, our uh, technologies and materials are uh, the heat recovery from uh, in aerospace applications, nuclear energy, industrial furnaces and metallurgical uh, processes, in transport, in geothermal. So the possible applications are uh, many and uh, the, the, the markets are very, very uh, uh, wide. Let's uh, analyze what is the state of the art of uh, the, 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 uh, the conversion technologies. We have got uh, 
the old uh, thermomechanical engines in which which got some some advantages but also disadvantages in which they, they, there are hot fluids feeding the uh, engines and uh, with the operations possible at high temperature able to cogenerate to 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 allow energy storage but uh, they are not compact systems. Uh, they have got uh, mechanical parts in movement, so with the degradation with the operating time. Uh, the efficiency depends on, on size. Uh, larger scales perform better. That's why only very large scales, uh, larger than, for example, capacities of 100 megawatt, is uh, economically feasible in concentrated solar power. We need to introduce an, uh, solid state converters, among them uh, thermophotovoltaic cell, uh, thermoelectric generators, thermionic uh, energy converters, which can operate at different uh, temperatures. Uh, the efficiency uh, uh, does not depend on size, so uh, they are upscalable and uh, downscalable. Uh, they are static converters. So it means no maintenance and long operating times. Uh, will the, this event and also the, the, the conference uh, next year will be focusing mainly in the materials, so nanomaterials uh, and uh, on technologies, uh, micro and nanotechnologies and so on. And uh, um, uh, today we will have a very insightful uh, flavor from from the speakers that, we, uh, that will uh, contribute to this uh, event. Uh, I recall that uh, some of the speakers uh, today and uh, some of the of, uh, uh, people in the scientific committee uh, contributed to the to the book uh, edited by Elsevier, high, ultra high temperature thermal energy storage transfer and conversion. Okay, for, for, for the moment, uh, it's, uh, I, I finished my introduction. I leave the floor to Gaspare Varvaro uh, to introduce the, uh, uh, the conference. Yes, thank you very much, Daniele. And of course, a good afternoon, everyone. Or maybe I have to say for someone, good morning and also good evening to someone. So actually, I have to say that it's a really a uh, great pleasure for me to chair uh, together with Daniele this uh, uh, colloquium. And um, so uh, as already, so now let me start a little bit uh, the uh, presentation because now before starting this colloquium, I would like to show you just a few slides about the, uh, the, 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 the conference that will be held uh, next uh, uh, next year in Iglesias. Indeed, as you know, this uh, uh, colloquium uh, is a kind of uh, short event that predates uh, uh, this extended conference that will be held uh, next year on July. So just let me uh, share uh, the screen. Okay. Uh, so, uh, no. Can you see my screen, I guess? Yeah. Yes, just to be sure. OK. So, so as you can see, uh, so this the, the next conference, of course, will be organized by me and Daniele. Of course, thanks to the, the support of the scientific committee, the, uh, the organizing committee here uh, reported. So, and also thanks to the support of uh, uh, the Science School Association and also the uh, I, uh, EIT uh, Regional Center, South Term, Italy. So, um, similarly, let's say to the uh, to the colloquium. Uh, so, also this conference will aim to, uh, to 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 straighten, let's say, the collaboration of researchers working in different fields of the energy conversions, including uh, uh, thermoelectrics, uh, materials and devices, uh, thermionics. Uh, uh, also thermophotovoltaics uh, and also the conventional photovoltaics and uh, 
concentrated photovoltaic uh, technologies. Actually, the idea is to uh, stimulate the discussion between these researchers with the with the with the aim to uh, to to uh, let's say to um, uh, to individuate to develop uh, uh, novel hybrid technology that combines all of these uh, technologies. So, as you can see. Uh, so the STEC conference will last three full days. We there will be probably seven sessions, and different to the colloquium, of course, we will have a plenary and also invite speakers and also oral and uh, post regular uh, communications. Uh, so as I told you at the beginning, so the conference will be held in Iglesias. Iglesias is a uh, historical, a very beautiful uh, city in the uh, southwest uh, uh, corner of uh, Sardinia. Uh, this kind of city can be easily reached uh, by fly from Rome. So, and then I really, I really hope that uh, uh, the COVID emergency will be over for that time. So this means that we can meet all together in this uh, very nice place uh, to discuss about uh, energy conversion but also to take uh, you know uh, the uh, opportunity to uh, the, to take uh, some uh, take uh, to profit uh, say of the uh, attraction uh, the traditions and also the natural beauties uh, of uh, this uh, uh, city uh, so i really hope to see all of you in this uh, conference but okay for now i think that it's time to start uh, this uh, colloquium and then i'm really Happy to give back the virtual floor to uh, to Daniela uh, to start this uh, um, the colloquium and the first. Thank talk. you, okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Yes. Sir. I share again uh, the screen in order to to show the people uh, which is the program. The the program of this uh, virtual event is uh, uh, divided into uh, three sessions in which in every session that there will be three speakers. Um, we encourage the audience to ask, to uh, pose uh, questions to the in, within the Q and A uh, section in the bottom of the screen. Uh, we will collect all the questions and uh, me and Gaspari will be the moderators for uh, asking these questions to for selecting and asking these questions to all the speakers at the end of the, each session. So the, the first session is mainly uh, focused on thermovoltaic, fermionic and uh, uh, thermovoltaic and fermionic. The second one in on thermoelectric uh, uh, energy converters. The third one on thermoelectric and fermionic uh, energy conversion. So uh, they are specific but uh, inspiring uh, conversion mechanisms, which can be the the, the future of uh, uh, of future converters uh, in uh, uh, energy conversion uh, for thermal from thermal and solar sources. So uh, I start uh, by introducing. Uh, no, uh, first of all, I will have uh, to introduce a poll. Emanuele, yeah. please could, could you please uh, because uh, there will be something interactive in uh, in this. Uh, a virtual event, if Emanuele could load on the screen the first poll. And uh, the audience can, can uh, uh, answer to, to, to the poll, obviously. It is, uh, okay, this is uh, the, the, the first poll. We will uh, answer to this at the end of the sessions. It is very general. What is the share of renewables in worldwide electricity generation? Uh, less than 10%, from 10 to 20%, from uh, 20 to 30%, larger than 30%. I wait uh, for... Uh, half a minute uh, in order to... Uh, all the audience can uh, answer to, to, the, to this poll. But maybe, Daniele, you can leave open up to the end. Okay. We can answer. I, I, I'm not able to click. This. Yes, because unfortunately the experts cannot answer. 
Ah, okay. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No, no. <laughs> so only only the audience only only the audience i don't know probably uh, we uh, gaspari we could uh, leave the the, the the poll open for all the the the, uh, the event no, no it's okay okay Okay, I think so. We can ask uh, Manuel. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. So uh, in uh, okay uh, now um, we will discover the the, the 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 result of this poll at the end of the session. But uh, in the meantime, I introduce the first speaker, uh, Antonio Marti, who will uh, talk us uh, about thermophotovoltaic, fermionic, and the hot carriers converters. What do they have in common? And uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Dr. Antonio Marti, uh, who received the, the one of the awards of the Universidad Politecnica de Madrid for the best doctoral thesis and uh, uh, the best young researcher. Uh, since 2007, he is uh, uh, chair professor in the area of electronic technology at the Universidad Politecnica de Madrid. Uh, he, his scientific career has been devoted to researching uh, uh, photon recycling uh, in thermodynamic limits of uh, photovoltaic processes. He introduced uh, two kind, two important kind of solar cells, uh, intermediate band solar cells, and uh, solar cells based on uh, free terminal heterojunction bipolar transistor. So I leave the floor to uh, Professor Martin. Uh, okay. Uh, thing I have to say is that, well, thank you for inviting me and unstable right now. So, yeah. so let's see what, uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to discuss what, uh, to try to find out what these three converters have in common. And for that, I will start with a short summary of a general solar thermal converter. You are all familiar with it, but still I would like to review it. The idea is that we have the sun, we capture some energy from the sun in, in, some, in a material that becomes hot. This material returns uh, some of the energy as emitted photons to the sun, and the rest of the energy is, is captured by a Carnot engine if assuming we want, because we want to, to, to extract the, the, the highest amount of work uh, possible. So for doing that, uh, when we want to calculate the efficiency, the efficiency is the ratio between the work produced um, and the energy that enters into the receiver has two parts. The first part is the accounts for the energy transfer from, from the sun to the Carnot engine. And the second part is the efficiency of the Carnot engine itself through this well-known factor. And just as a sole reminder uh, in the way about the way we compute, we calculate this efficiency is that we, we state that this process has to be reversible meaning that the energy, the entropy that enters into the converter has to be equal to the energy that outputs the converter. Uh, the, uh, as a result, the efficiency, the resulting efficiency is 85%. It has to be optimized for the temperature of the absorber, which uh, becomes to be 2,544 Kelvin degrees. But the idea, the motivation for the work is to try to review um, how, how to implement in practice this Carnot engine and to discuss about whether we can implement it with a hot carrier solar cell, with a TPV converter or with a thermoionic converter, with whether it is possible to implement them, to implement it with any of those converter or with all of them. So we start with a hot carrier solar cell that was proposed by Rose, but the model was reviewed deeply by Burfeld in 1997. Um, yeah, uh, summarizing how it works, mm, the, the, the energy from the sun is captured in the most general uh, in case by a gas of electrons that the, don't interact with anything else. They don't interact with photon, with phonon, for example. And 
uh, this is, was mainly the contribution by Peter Wurfeld. He, he realized that in order to get the maximum efficiency, the energy had to be extracted by through energy selective contacts, which are uh, energy channels, are monoenergetic ener energy energy channels. So, so the energy through through this uh, connector is, is 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 constant, and it's a single one. So he proved that through this energy selective contact, the temperature of the electrons could be reduced from being hot to being cold at the time that the chemical energy of each electron could be rise to, to from the chemical chemical energy inside the converter to, to the chemical energy, electrochemical energy we measure outside the converter. And this was connected to, to, to the load where we got the work output. But there, is an, there was another, another detail that in my opinion has not been emphasized, which is that uh, in this assumption, there was no return uh, of, of any flux from the converter to, from the load to the converter. We will see later what this means. But the idea is that the, the converter, this load was not emitting electrons back Towards the towards the absorber, but just a single flux was circulating through all the system. Um, when we review the thermodynamics behind this, we have this part we saw before, which is common through all the devices, and this contact behaves as as a Carnot engine, takes the energy from the electrons. It cannot make work of all the energy, but only part of it, which is the electrochemical energy of, of the electrons, and it releases some, some heat. And then the other contact is another engine, which takes part of that work to pump out some heat from the ambient towards the, the, the converter in, in order to, to return an energy epsilon V in this case to, to, to the absorber. Um, when you do the calculations, you realize that you find out that you, you get the, again the same efficiency of the, of the converter. A, a short note about the hot carrier solar cell converter is that the power output is independent of the energies of those contacts. So the energy can be very close. In that case, the converter will produce a very high current, or the, the distance between the contacts can be very high. In that case, the converter will produce a low current, but a, but a higher about a high output voltage. But the power output in all cases will be the same. What about the thermionic converter? Um, well, in the thermionic converter, we capture the energy from the sun. Um, the, the emitter emits electrons to, towards the collector, and electrons with an energy higher than the work function of the emitter. But the collector also emits back electrons towards the emitter. And the remaining electrons are returned back to, to the emitter. So what we find here is that there is the energy transfer is not monoenergetic. Electrons have a, lot, a full range of energies in, in both senses. And also there is, there, there is a return flux meaning that the collector is emitting back electrons towards the, the hot uh, emitter, which this was not happening, happening in the hot carrier solar cell. So can we approach this to, to a hot carrier solar cell or to, a, to an ideal converter? The inspiration from the hot carrier solar cell is that the energy transfer should be monochromatic, but, uh, in, but in the case of the thermionic converter, at least I don't know how to do it. But when you uh, assume monochromaticity and make everything reversible, which means you make uh, all the entropy fluxes equal to zero, the net flux equal to zero, you find out that you find the maximum efficiency, but at the cost of, uh, of the work per unit of area going to zero, which means that if you want to increase the, the total amount of work, you, you need to compensate with a larger emission area. 
What about the TPV converter? It, again, it, initially it is the same in the sense that it is polychromatic, but in the case, but now uh, the particles interchanging energy are not electrons, are photons. And in the case of photons, at least conceptually, we have the means for making the flux monochromatic because we can think of ideal reflectors that filter the energy of the photons. So the, you can interchange energy between the emitter and, and the solar cell through a monochromatic channel. Um, the other difference is that electrons are decoupled from the emitter. The electrons are not pumped back to the emitter, but they circulate through, through the TPV cell. In this case, again, you, when you try to you force the entropy creation to be zero, uh, you, you look for reversibility, you again find out that the work output uh, per unit of area goes to zero. So in this case, you also need to compensate if you want a higher net output of work to, to have a higher area. So what is the, the summary of this? That in all cases, you can achieve the, the maximum theoretical efficiency, but in a, you, you need monoenergetic, what I'm calling here monoenergetic energy transfer channels that in the hot carrier solar cell, uh, well, you, you assume by definition they are possible, although you don't know how to do it. In the TPV case, you, at least conceptually, you know how to, how to approach them. In the case of the thermionic converter, at least I don't know how to do it. And in the hot carrier solar cell, there is no energy flux return through the same channel, in, in, but there is uh, this uh, return in, of energy in the case of the TPV and the thermionic case. And um, the consequence in terms of power density is that in the hot carrier solar cell, uh, it, it doesn't matter, but in the TPV cell and in the thermionic case, because the work goes to zero, you, you need to increase, to increase the area. Well, a short acknowledgement to our funders, projects to GAPS, Madrid PV2 and Greco. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Marti, for uh, the presentation. I, I go to the next speaker, Rodolfo Vaillon. Uh, Rodolfo Vaillon is a CNRS uh, uh, professor at the Institute of Electronics and uh, Systems in, in France. His current main interests are nanoscale thermal radiation, thermophotovoltaic energy conversion, and the thermal behavior of uh, solar cells. Uh, he will talk uh, about, uh, he will present a presentation uh, of the title, with the title Recent Advances in Near Field Thermophotovoltaics. Please, uh, Rodolfo. Well, thank, thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, I need to share the screen. So thank you for the invitation. First, uh, I have to say that the main results of the presentation were obtained by Christophe Lucchesi during his PhD thesis and by uh, Dilek Kakiroglu, who was a postdoc with us. So uh, I will explain first why near-field thermophotovoltaics give the principles and the theory theoretical expectations that we have for a near-field thermophotovoltaics. Then I will mostly focus on the recent experimental advances. And if you, if you agree, I will share with you some of the remaining challenges that we have. So if we compare thermoelectrics, thermoelectrics with thermo thermophotovoltaics, Thermoelectrics is mostly for low grade and medium grade heat sources. The efficiency reaches 10%, but the main advantage of thermoelectrics is that electrical power density largely exceeds one watt per square centimeter. Comparatively, thermophotovoltaics, it's a power conversion efficiency, which is defined by the ratio of electrical power to the net radiation power absorbed by the PV cell can exceed 30% at, as will be shown in the next presentation. However, the power density is lower than what, one watt per square centimeter. So the question here, how to improve 
uh, electrical power density of TPV while keeping efficiency high. Well, one solution is to bring the hot emitter at a distance from the TPV cell D, which is a smaller than the uh, characteristic wavelength of thermal radiation, which is 10 micron at room temperature. And then, thanks to the additional contribution of the evanescent waves in the near field, what we will expect is that the radiation power, which is constant in the far field, you see that on, on the graph uh, on, on, on the right, will increase thanks to the, these evanescent waves. Now for the electrical power, if the increase uh, follows the same trend, then the efficiency will remain the same in the near field. However, if the increase of the electrical power in the near field is larger, then efficiency will increase. And if the rate is smaller, efficiency will decrease. But in any case, there is a huge near field enhancement of the electrical power. There were many, many near field radiation, uh, radiation experiments achieved so far. So each point of, on this graph corresponds to a setup where uh, you have the minimal, dis minimum distance achieved by each setup and the maximum temperature difference between the emitter, the, the hot plate and the cold plate. So you, you see that there are a different configuration for the geometry the plane plane configuration, the sphere plane configuration, and the T plane configuration. But what is important here to see is that there are many experiments for which the minimum distance was a smaller than 500 nanometers. However, the maximum temperature was uh, never above 500 Kelvin. So the question is, um, given that, is it possible to make an experiment demonstration of near field TPV? Well, the answer is yes. So there were three recent demonstrations with plain uh, plane geometries. For the first one, uh, indium arsenide was used with a low band gap, and you see the evolution of the IV characteristics as the distance decreases. So with that, a near field enhancement of 40, so which is defined by the maximum electrical power in the near field the electrical power in the, in the far field. So this an enhancement of 40 was achieved. In the second one, indium gallium arsenide, which has a larger band gap was used and the near field enhancement of 10 was obtained with a record uh, temperature difference of 740 Kelvin. In the third one, uh, germanium was used and uh, in this experiment, a near field enhancement of 10 was also ob ob obtained with a temperature difference a little bit above 500 Kelvin. But in all of these experiments, the electrical power density was smaller than one milliwatt per square centimeter, and the efficiency was estimated and all below one person. In our experiment, what we use is a graphite sphere which has a diameter of 40 micron uh, as the emitter, which is attached to a, a thermal microscope probe. And at the tip of this probe, we have a resistive part, which is used as the heater and the thermometer. And with this, we can measure the variation of the net radiation power absorbed as a function of distance from contact to five micrometer. As for the TPV cell, we choose indium antimony, which has a very low band gap of 0 0.23 electron volts, which allows a better collection of the infrared photons. However, like many infrared detectors, we had to cool down the TPV cells to 77 Kelvin. So the cells, they were specifically designed for the near field, fabricated and characterized. So the way the measurements are done are, are, are this. So the current is measured as a function of distance for different voltages. Then the usual IV characteristics can be reconstructed. And we see the evolution of these IV characteristics as the distance between the uh, emitter and the TPV cell decreases. Then it is possible to determine 
the electrical power at the maximum power point as a function of distance. So this is what we have done here. This is the case of a graphite a spherical emitter at the temperature of 732 Kelvin. And you see as a function of distance, the increase of the electrical power. And in this case, we find a near fin enhancement of 4.6. But you have to remember that here, we have a sphere plane configuration for which the near field radiation exchange is much smaller than the plane plane configuration. As I told you before, it is possible to measure at the same time the net radiation power absorbed as a function of distance. And we see that the measurement, they compare very well with calculations. And with these two measurements, by making the ratio, it is possible to determine the near field power conversion efficiency, which in this case, at the minimum distance, reaches 14%. So what are the parameters maximizing performance? Uh, we made measurements for two different substrate thicknesses, and thinning out the substrate improves the electrical power as well as the power conversion efficiency. Increasing the doping concentration of the, the P layer of the, of the PV cell increase the electrical power, but we couldn't get any da data for the efficiency. At the bottom of this slide, there is a summary of the best performances that we got. So a record temperature difference of 823 Kelvin, a maximum electrical power density of 0 0.570 watt per square centimeter at the emitter temperature of only 732 Kelvin, a field factor for the PV cell uh, reaching 0 0.75, and a measured uh, near field uh, power conversion efficiency reaching 14%. Now I would like to share with you my views of the remaining challenges that um, we have ahead of us. For the emitter, um, we need to find materials with resonance just above the band gap for the low band gap semiconductors. Then uh, thermally insulating nanospatials are likely to play a big role uh, to build emitter cell nanogaps with large delta T and large exchange areas. In the, 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 the results that I have presented uh, before, the exchange areas were pretty small. For the TPV cell, there is one strong issue. This is the high illumination, like in concentrated uh, solar PV. So we have to design front contacts, minimizing shadowing and series resistance. Then would it be possible to build low band gap PV cells operating at room temperature? This is another question. Minimi minimi minimizing absorption below the band gap and the recycling the reflecting photons toward the emitter is very, very important for uh, near field TPV cells as well as for far field. And then the, the, the last goal that we would like to achieve is um, an efficiency larger than 30% in the near field, the same way it was achieved recently in the far field as it will be presented in the, in the next presentation. So with that, I would like to thank the sponsor and um, I would like to, uh, to take the opportunity of this talk for announcing uh, a, a symposium during the spring meeting uh, next year that was um, postponed to 2021 uh, because uh, of, of the, the, the COVID situation. So thank you very much for uh, yeah, listening to me. Thank you, Rodolfo, very interesting presentation. Uh, let's go to the next speaker, Dr. Andre Lennert. Uh, let me introduce Dr. Lennert. Uh, intro, uh, Dr. Lennert uh, received his PhD from MIT in 2014 and was a post postdoctoral fellow at the, the University of Michigan. He is a recipient of several recognition, including the 3M non-tenured uh, faculty award and the force 30 and the under 30 in science. Please, uh, Dr. Lena. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so it's a pleasure uh, to be here and, and present some of our work where we've uh, realized uh, some of the highest efficiencies in uh, TPV conversion very recently. Um, and uh, 
Um, I'm going to jump right into it because uh, Rodolf uh, was alluding to it. And so um, might as well start with the end. So uh, what we were able to achieve is, is a device that has a, a air pocket built in under the absorber. And I'll talk about how this was achieved. Uh, really some very nice work from students that are working on this project and great guidance uh, from one of my collaborators, uh, Professor Stephen Forrest, uh, who is really well known in the optoelectronics community for uh, OLEDs, of course, but uh, I convinced him to join forces and work on TPVs as well, and it's been a fruitful collaboration. Um, so uh, as Rodolfo alluded, these cells were, uh, we were able to show that they could achieve efficiencies above 30%. So let me just give you some background as to uh, where we stood before this work and how we got there. Uh, this was um, work that was, um, we published this in a review paper in Juul earlier this year, where we looked at the progression of TPV energy conversion and technology over the years, over the last three decades. And uh, one of the things that uh, came out of this analysis is, is um, framing the, the efficiency in terms of spectral management and carrier management. And so the efficiency is a product of those. And here I'm showing the progression uh, along these axes of spectral and carrier management um, and, and how the different technologies, how the different um, cells um, have been able to achieve different fractions of the radiative limit. So this is a, a thermodynamic uh, limit that only considers radio recombination as the carrier uh, recombination mechanism. So recently, um, uh, we had, um, in, in 2019, we had a, a paper out of a group out of Berkeley that was able to demonstrate 29% uh, TPV conversion efficiency. And uh, we can see from this plot that they, they made a leap in carrier management with respect to some of the earlier studies. In particular, Swanson in the 70s did remarkable work with silicon TPV cells and showed very high spectral efficiency, um, but the group out of Berkeley was able to, using a thin film architecture, a heterostructure, achieve better carrier management. And I just want to tell you that we will we will not surpass their carrier management. This this carrier management figure still stands as the best. Uh, however, our work was able to improve spectral management significantly uh, with respect to prior work. And so, let me just give you a sense of what spectral management captures. It's a, it's a measure of how well we utilize the broad spectrum of black body radiation. So TPV conversion is, is usually best suited uh, for converting the tail of the black body distribution. So this, this part shown in green, that's usually where calculations show that the, the band gap should lie for, for highest efficiency. And it could be one band gap, it could be two band gaps, but spectral efficiency really captures the photo current or the short circuit current that's generated from converting this part of the spectrum times the uh, voltage uh, of the band gap, um, divided by basically the, the net radiative exchange between the emitter and the cell. So this, it could be a very broad distribution. And then carrier management is just the ratio of the blue box to the black box. And uh, this, these are the current voltage characteristics of the device. So basically how much power is generated with respect to a product of the photo current and the band gap voltage. So that's what these two metrics uh, lie, uh, show. So uh, let me jump into how we approach this problem. Um, one, of the th one of the biggest issues with reaching high efficiency is managing the large amount of power that lies below the band gap. And so we call this out of band radiation. Um, in band radiation at a prototypical temperature of 1500 Kelvin and with an indium gallium arsenide uh, thermal photovoltaic cell, of which has a band gap of around 0.74 eV, uh, the in-band radiation only accounts for about 18% of the power. So you can see that uh, the biggest driver in the efficiency is how you manage this out-of-band radiation. And there are two main ways that people have worked on, and including myself. And one is uh, engineering some sort of photonic structure at the emitter that suppresses emission in this out-of-band range right off the bat. The other way is to reflect light uh, by the PV cell, reflect this out-of-band radiation back to the emitter. And, and Professor Marty alluded to the importance of this in reaching high efficiency. Um, and, and, and in practice, this approach of reflection uh, can be easier to achieve because photonic structures are high, at high temperatures are very challenging to engineer. So the idea is getting to high efficiencies by keeping the same power generation 
but decreasing the denominator and the denominator describes the amount of absorbed power, which can either be done through decreased emission or through increased reflection. Um, and I just um, want to show that uh, some of the previous efforts that have been done in, in mitigating out of band radiation, uh, these include selective emitters, including photonic crystal cavities uh, that have modes that only emit above the band gap, multi-layer structures or combination of plasma filters and interference filters. And then more recently, the work that I alluded to by the, uh, by the group out of Berkeley, which looked at a thin film indium gallium arsenide photovoltaic cell on a back, with a high back surface reflectance that's enabled by gold BSR. Um, however, one of the limitations of, of these past approaches has been that they only suppress 95% of the out of band power. Um, in particular, this state of the art uh, device achieves 29% efficiency with 95% suppression of out of band power. So you might say 95%, that seems pretty good, but theoretical calculations will show that you can achieve much higher efficiencies if you go closer to 100% out of band suppression because of all of the power that's contained in that band. So if we look at a radiative limit calculation at 95%, we're limited to 40, 47% efficiency under these conditions. If we go, uh, as an example, closer to 100% suppression, we can get to 59% thermal to electrical conversion efficiency. So you can see this is a uh, remarkable gain that we can achieve with uh, marginal increases in out of band suppression. So that's, that's how that's, this theoretical consideration has really framed the work that we've been doing with uh, Steve Forrest and in my group. Uh, so one of the first things that we tried to do to increase the reflectance compared to that conventional thin film structure that the Berkeley group achieved was to create a, a low index spacer, um, magnesium fluoride between the absorber and the gold layer. And uh, in, in principle, if we look at an interference calculation, we can see that the out of band reflectance can, can be as high as 98.4%. Uh, however, uh, when we fabricated this uh, layered structure, and, and this was work that we published in 2018, we were only able to achieve about 96% out of band reflectance. And one of the issues that we were dealing with is that water was causing parasitic absorption. And so we were getting deviations from our theory. And um, there, you know, as far as we've seen so far, th there haven't been any studies that have used the dielectric, a low index dielectric spacer with, with uh, a lot of success. I think this is related to the issue with eliminating infrared absorption entirely with uh, a dielectric spacer. So um, a different concept emerged from our group where we just decided maybe we could get rid of the dielectric spacer altogether and replace it with nothing. And when I say nothing, I mean air. And so this was a pretty bold concept where, um, you know, in theory, we could get to very high efficiencies because we have lossless Fresnel reflectance at each interface. We maximize the mismatch of refractive indices between the uh, surrounding layers to the spacer. And overall, we could produce very high reflectances in theory. So this is another transfer matrix simulation showing we could get closer to 99% reflectance. And this is averaged over all incidence angles. Um, so how did we uh, go about making this uh, structure? So it, it ended up being quite simple. I actually eliminated one of the steps compared to our dielectric uh, spacer structure. So we start out by uh, a, a um, epi film on a indium phosphide substrate. The epi is the indium gallium arsenide absorber. We put down these uh, grid lines of gold that are uh, about a few microns thick. Um, then we do a wafer bonding step where we transfer this whole wafer and bond it to a gold coated uh, silicon substrate. So basically a gold mirror. And we do a gold gold bond at around 150 Celsius for a few hours. Uh, after that, we actually etch away the uh, growth substrate, the indium phosphide substrate, leaving behind the absorber uh, in the, uh, the TPV cell. So this is the epifilm epi that's left behind. And then we pattern out the, the area and put down top grids. So it's a pretty simple process if you look at it. But remarkably, we're able to preserve uh, the air 
that's captured, that's basically uh, uh, trapped uh, during that wafer bonding step. And so this is the silicon handle. These are SEM images showing the top of the epifilm, uh, top of the contact line, and the air gap that we were able to achieve. So if we zoom in, we see these beautiful pictures where we have this thin 600 nanometer layer of air um, that's separating the absorber from the gold mirror. And we see that we, we have a very wide span, about 80 microns across between gold supports uh, that we're able to achieve. And we can sustain this very small gap of air. So now when we look at experimentally and compared to our simulations, we're able to to actually match our simulations, we no longer have that unexpected parasitic absorption. And so we can achieve about 98.5% out of band reflectance. And this is 4% uh, higher than we've done before and about 4.5% uh, um, or closer to 5% better than the cells that were achieved by Ber the Berkeley group. So we went ahead and characterized the efficiency and I'm not gonna spend too much time on how we do this, but. You know, if, if you're in the field, there's some nuances as, how, as to how you characterize efficiency of such small cells. We made them on a three millimeter scale. And so we, we decided to go with a simulator, basically what we call a TPV simulator that mimics illumination conditions in, a, in an actual generator. And uh, what we do is we measure output power and we calculate how much is absorbed by the cell based on our FTIR uh, measurements. And then we, uh, we basically produce an efficiency or power conversion efficiency that is a ratio of electrical power output versus what would be absorbed by that cell. And if we change the position of the uh, source of the thermal source, we can vary the illumination current. So uh, what we show is that as the function of illumination current, um, we, we have uh, efficiencies that approach 32%. So as we go to higher illumination, closer to one amp per centimeter squared, the voltage improves. However, when we go to higher currents uh, still, then we're dominated by ohmic losses. And so this produces uh, a, a maximum efficiency of about 32% near one amp per centimeter squared. And here is the current voltage characteristic at one amp per centimeter squared. And one of the things uh, I wanna note is this is a, is a very nice looking IV curve. Uh, however, our open circuit voltage is 450 millivolts. And um, I just wanna say that there's some room for improvement here. If we look at the Berkeley group, they were able to achieve open circuit voltages closer to 530 millivolts. So um, the exciting thing is that if we improve the material quality of our epifilm, we have another you know, 10, 15% improvement in efficiency uh, that's really within reach in the short term. Um, and I think the most exciting thing to me about the air bridge uh, our architecture that we've developed is that it could be an enabler to reaching even higher efficiencies and also an enabler to working with materials that are uh, less expensive. Uh, and and to, to the organizer's point, if we want to use thermal photovoltaics for solar, uh, usually we're limited uh, at, with the kind of temperatures that we have access to. So maybe we don't have access to 1500 Kelvin, maybe we can only get to about 700 Celsius uh, in a solar converter. So it's very important to think about how do we make use of these lower temperatures. And, and this plot uh, shows spectral efficiency as a function of, of band gap divided by the heat source temperature. It's a very informative plot if, if you're in the field. But let me just explain to you what you're seeing here. Uh, the air bridge architecture is, is different from, diff from previous architectures because it uh, creates this, it, it opens up the possibility of working in a regime where we're not very sensitive to the band gap of the device or the temperature of the heat source. So that's this blue regime here. Whereas in the past, when we were limited by out of band reflectance of 95%, we were on a trajectory where we increased band gap, we would get to much lower efficiencies. And the other way to think about this is if we decrease temperature, we would get to much lower efficiencies. But now with the airbridge architecture, we could actually think about getting to possibly higher efficiencies by going to higher band gaps uh, where carrier management is much better, or we could maintain efficiency and decrease temperature. So this is a very exciting prospect for the field and something that we're working towards. Um, so we've demonstrated this airbridge architecture in this prototypical in gas system, but I think it can be applied to many other systems 
and also near field PPVs uh, like uh, Rodolphe was uh, uh, mentioning as well. So with that, I'd like to summarize and uh, thank our funding sources. Thank you, Dr. Lehner, for uh, the very interesting presentation. And uh, I will would like to go to the second poll, and I ask uh, to the uh, technical direction to to show the second poll. Okay, uh, this is uh, uh, it. Doesn't need uh, it. Doesn't have a correct answer. Uh, this poll, and uh, okay, it is what what will be the disruptive key technology for the future solar energy conversion. Um, please, uh, uh, I ask the audience to, 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 uh, to answer uh, this question. And uh, also, uh, I ask, uh, I encourage uh, the audience to uh, write down questions in the Q&A uh, section uh, you will find uh, in the, 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 probably in the uh, bottom of the window um, of the Zoom uh, webinar. Okay, let's uh, close for, uh, for uh, this poll and let's see uh, what is the opinion of uh, the, the, um, of the people. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, there's a, a majority, a large majority, uh, uh, who voted hybridization of uh, conversion technologies. And um, this is also my opinion, but uh, I didn't vote. <laughs> so, and uh, okay. Uh, let's start. It's interesting to 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 call catch. Uh, to collect the, the, the opinions from uh, from our audience, um, I would like to 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 make some questions to to the speakers. Starting from uh, Antonio Marti, uh, I would like to to briefly ask uh, uh, what um, Antonio, how uh, 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 we are far from a real product. Uh, uh, based on thermoelectron converters applied to solar energy, which are the challenges to, to, to be uh, surpassed uh, in the present technology? It, it is very general. Uh, yeah, question. well, I, um, I guess um, is, uh, as I tried to explain that he, and we understand this better in comparison with thermophotovoltaics is that we cannot uh, make the interaction, uh, the interchange of energy between the emitter and the collector monochromatic. So uh, we, 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 we can achieve something similar, for example, if the work function of the emitter and also the collector is very high, because in this case, although it is not monochromatic, uh, only a few electrons, the ones with the highest energy, can escape. But but in this case, uh, the problem of the power density increases be because because the current is 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 is, is even lower. So I would say that uh, it is the the one which is further from from maximum efficiency. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, one question to, to Rodolphe. What is the most technically challenging uh, part in a TPV uh, cell? Uh, you, you, you talked about a bit uh, during the, the presentation, but- uh, Yes, well, you, you mean for near 50 PV, yeah. Yes, so, yes. Yes, so have, have you have seen uh, even for the near field radiation experiments, the, there has been a limitation so far about the, the temperature difference between the hot uh, body and the cold body. So, and uh, it was mainly uh, for the near field uh, TPV experiments that the, the maximum uh, temperature difference record was broken because we really need it for our TPV. Otherwise, if the temperature of the emitter is too low, so the, you are likely to have uh, a bad collection of the infrared photons. So this is the reason why that we, we choose the strategy of the low band gap TPV cells, 
but uh, unfortunately, um, for very low band gap, they, they cannot work at the room temperature right now. So I would say either we work with the, the best TPV cell that we have right now, so the mostly the in-gas TPV cells, which have the record uh, efficiency uh, efficiencies in the far field, but uh, we would need the, the temperature of the emitter to increase and then to build a nano gap in between the emitter and the receiver. And then you know very well this problem. So if we want to make a device, we would need some kind of nano spacers, thermally insulating, and uh, without any issues, uh, mechanical issues. So this is quite challenging. So there, there, there might be a, a compromise in between these uh, two options. So a large temperature difference and the best TPV cells uh, existing so far and trying to go to smaller temperature differences, but you would need to um, design new TPV cells with lower band gaps. And there is a last um, issue that in my opinion is very important is the omiclosis that Andre was uh, talking about, because when you have high illumination, you have uh, uh, high uh, omiclosis, and uh, then this uh, top grid that uh, you must have in the front uh, will become a problem for near field TPV. So there are solutions proposed here and there, but uh, not in the experiments. So in the experiments, the TPV cells they are very small, they are micrometric or very small TPV cells. So this will be a, a, another uh, a challenge to, to be overcome. Thank you, Rodolf. And uh, the, the last, uh, last general question uh, to uh, Andrei Lennert. Um, okay, uh, we uh, are close to, to, to have efficient uh, TPV cells. What is, uh, what section of industry market uh, TPV can enter and succeed in the near future, in your opinion? It's very general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think there are some challenges when it comes to deploying TPV technology today that are related to cost. Um, and and um, specifically when I talk about cost, usually people think of a, a dollar per watt type of metric. Um, so, you know, there are companies that are commercializing TPV technology and they're trying to drive up the watt, the denominator, so increasing that power density. And, uh, you know, it, it, we come across similar challenges as Rodolf mentioned, uh, maybe just motivated from an economical perspective is when you get to high power densities, you're dealing with ohmic losses. Um, and so uh, there are opportunities, I think, to get around those intrinsic high costs that are associated with epitaxial growth on expensive uh, three, five substrates. And, um, including you know, processing technologies that can recycle the wafer, the, the growth substrate, which usually costs about $20,000 American per meter squared. So if we can reuse that wafer over and over again, as you see, it's not actually part of the device that we fabricated. So if we can reuse it to make thin films, that, that could be a, a nice uh, way to get to lower costs and also a more sustainable approach to processing. Um, I think, the, you know, and your question was which markets do TPVs have a shot at getting into? I think, uh, you know, at this stage, uh, probably markets that are not overly concerned with the dollar metric. Uh, so probably remote power generation or military applications. And that's, that's always been sort of the, the case, uh, as well as RTGs or, or you know, uh, power generators for space exploration. Um, where other metrics are, are very important, like size and power density and those aspects. But if we want to get to applications that can, um, you know, such as solar energy conversion, uh, then we really care about those metrics and we're not quite there. So that's something we need to address. Thank you very much. And uh, let's pass uh, uh, shortly to the session two and I leave the floor to the, to the other chairman, Gaspari Barbaro. Yes, uh, thank you, Daniele. Just to stop you a while because there are two two questions from the audience uh, in the Q and the. So uh, yeah. I, I don't know if you want to just uh, make this this question to 
to the speaker. Yes, the, 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 the first one, when, when the experts think we can have a commercial industrial product, um, I, I, I think uh, in order to, 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 to reply uh, briefly, uh, I think uh, uh, it depends on, uh, on uh, the, 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 the uh, on the application, because probably aerospace application uh, uh, is uh, closer, uh, the, the, the technology is closer to the market. And uh, uh, okay, what is the cost impact of the gold contact? I think it is uh, um, negligible because the, but uh, I, I ask the, 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 also the opinion of the other uh, speakers because it is a very thin uh, contact. Uh, we, we speak about uh, uh, tens to hundreds of nanometers. So the, 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 the cost is, uh, is low, uh, the, 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 I think. <laughs> Yeah, I just I just wanted to add that uh, it is it is low as as a fraction of the overall cost currently. Uh, however, if if we reduce the cost of the epifilm, it could be a more significant part of that cost. And I think it's important to note that if we want to get to very high power densities, we actually have to have very thick contact lines, you know. And and people are working on contact lines that are as thick as, thick as ten microns to bring down those ohmic losses. So. It, uh, once you get to 10 microns, you know, you're, you're looking at uh, some, some fraction of the cost that's not insignificant. Thank you, thank you. Let, let's pass to the, I, I yeah. don't see any, any more questions. Let's pass no. to the session two, to Gaspar. Okay, thank you very much, Daniele. So I'm really pleased to chair this session that is mainly devoted to thermoelectrics, uh, thermoelectric materials so that uh, as, I guess you know that can be used either to recover uh, energy from a waste uh, heat, but also for cooling uh, and uh, also temperature uh, um, regulation. Uh, so uh, what about this session? So in this session, we have uh, three talks. So the first uh, uh, talks, it, uh, it will be given by Professor Varlamov. It is um, a general talks. Uh, where Professor Varlamos will uh, uh, um, uh, speak about some fundamental aspects and perspectives of thermoelectrics materials. Uh, then we have two more specific uh, talks about uh, uh, liquid thermoelectrics and also the, uh, defect, uh, the effect of uh, uh, the defects on thermoelectrics properties uh, of some uh, materials that will be given by uh, Dr. Nakamae and Professor Yu, uh, uh, respectively. So, okay, so before uh, starting with the first speaker, I would like to also for this session, would like to launch uh, the uh, poll. So, I just ask uh, the uh, Emanuele to launch this poll. And um, so, just so let's wait. Okay, so the question is how much energy produced by humanity is wasted as thermal losses? 70%, uh, uh, 50%, 25%. So I just ask you to answer this poll now because we discovered that it, we cannot leave open for the whole world session. So you have, uh, let's say, one minute to, to answer this poll and then we can discuss about the results at the end of the um, of this uh, session. So uh, now, in the meantime, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, again uh, the first uh, speaker, uh, Professor Andrei uh, Varlamov from the Institute for Superconductivity and Innovative Materials of the Italian National Research uh, Council. So Professor Ma Varlamov has given uh, over his career, uh, I mean, uh, I think an extraordinary contribution uh, for the development of the theory of superconductivity, uh, thermoelectric and also thermomagnetic phenomena in the condensed matter. And today, Andre will give us a, a talk uh, titled uh, Thermoelectricity from the Iron Arc of the Epoch of Alessandro Volta to Ferrofluids Today. So Andre, I give you the floor if you need some help to to share the screen. There is a, a, a green button uh, uh, just at the end of the, of the window. Uh, I hope that I have uh, 
shared it? Do you see yeah. my screen? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody, to whom this is afternoon, or good morning, to whom this is morning. So uh, today I wanted to, because I have 10 minutes, so I can say a lot of and nothing. So I decided to find some uh, middle way about. I decided to speak about the thermoelectricity from the iron arc of the epoch of Alexandra Volta to ferrofluids today. Uh, uh, this uh, work is much more extended, was done together with uh, Yulia Shikina and David Apetis in the frameworks of our European project Magenta. So uh, um, we, uh, this um, project is devoted to study of thermoelectricity in uh, ferrofluids and mainly devoted to Ziebeck effect. We are so a bit old to speak about Ziebeck effect, but you know that Neofito e più santo di Papa. So being Italian adopted, so uh, and being the uh, uh, correspondent member of uh, Academia Institute uh, of Science and uh, Literature, Instituto Lombardo, I uh, learned some old materials and the um, dis dispute between uh, Galvani and Volta. All of us know that Luigi Galvani noticed the nerve and muscles of a dissected frog co contracted abruptly when placed between dissimilar metal probes. This, uh, and uh, he assumed that this is a, some kind of animal electricity, which was very popular in the 18th century. And this uh, Alessandro Volta, who was professor of Pavia University, first was very skeptic about this. Nevertheless, his colleagues convinced him to repeat experiments of Galvani. And to his surprise, Alessandro Volta found that indeed, when he created the uh, circuit of the muscle of frog and an um, arc of two dissimilar metals, he discovered that indeed there are these convulsions. Yet, contrastly to uh, Galvani, he attributed uh, as a generator of electricity, not the muscle of frog, but the uh, couple of two dissimilar metals. And this was discovery of contact difference of potentials. But uh, this is well known, but uh, not too much people knows that uh, Volta continued his uh, studies and he used as an arc only one metal, uh, uh, iron arc, but he put his circuit, as you see here, in the vessels with different temperatures. So he uh, used ferro arc, iron arc, and uh, the role of electrometer played this muscle of frog, and he noticed again uh, convulsions. So actually, he was the first who discovered thermoelectricity, he, which he correctly attributed to non-homogeneous heating of the metallic arc. Then, okay, these are nice stories which I will tell you about Ziebeck next time, but Ziebeck, uh, in uh, 23 years later, he uh, uh, tried to repeat the uh, fancy, those times, Ersted experiments using, uh, instead of current, the difference of temperatures. And he called this effect as a thermomagnetism. It was Ersted who gave physically correct explanation of the phenomenon of the electric current in circuit, in circuit due to the heat and coined the term thermoelectricité. Fourier and Ersted made the first thermopile for thermoelectric power generation. But all this uh, was so, what was the essence of discovered by Ziebeck effect, that if you have two dissimilar metals, connect them in circuit and put one end at temperature T1, another T2, so the voltage appears, as you see here in the scheme, which is proportional to the difference of temperature and difference of some characteristics of each metal, which we call now Ziebeck effect, which is returning to his experiment of Volta, the potential difference which appears at the uh, um, divided to applied difference of temperature. Very good. How to understand 
physically what is uh, how it works thermocouple. Uh, it is very nice. Uh, you can read uh, in Goupil, uh, the Christoph Goupil uh, review. You can see that uh, just let's compare thermocouple with uh, the Carnot, machine, uh, Carnot engine. To produce work, you need to have temperature difference and pressure difference. You have uh, to create two adiabats and two isotherms. In the metal, you do not have molecular gas. You have Fermi gas, degenerated gas, which has temperature and is characterized by Fermi energy or chemical potential. Chemical potential of Fermi energy for different metals are different, but you can easily see that chemical potential of Fermi energy is expressed as a power of P Fermi. P Fermi determines you this pressure. So role of pressure plays chemical potential. So having two different uh, metals and putting them at different temperature, you create Carnot engine in some sense. So unfortunately, besides this, uh, it is necessary to, uh, for practical applications to have good efficiency. And uh, initially thermo uh, generators were bad because first of all, the Z big coefficients are very small, I will explain you now. The second, they are not efficient and I will pass to discussion of this. Uh, so I want to show you very simple and not always correct, correct for open circuit so-called Kelvin formula. So uh, it is possible to show that Z big coefficient, if we do not take into account the scattering processes, etc. Et so in thermodynamic approach, is proportional to the d mu over dt, where mu is a, a, a chemical potential of our sample. So for metal, chemical potential is Fermi energy, chemical potential at zero temperature, minus t square divided mu. So you see immediately, so unfortunately, this smallness in derivative d mu over dt contains temperature divided mu. Temperature 300 Kelvin, mu several electron volts. So you will have already smallness 10 minus 3. And indeed, usually you can see here that metals have very small Z big coefficients, which are uh, expressed in microvolts, tens of microvolts. The maximum may be bismuth, which has 72 microvolt per microvolt per Kelvin. But uh, immediately you can say, but we have uh, the gener we can have some degenerated Fermi system also in doped semiconductors. And indeed, you can see that in doped semiconductors, this value increases at least for one order. So and there is a, a beautiful anecdote, the, 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 the historical anecdote that uh, uh, Abraham Yoff uh, was a, the famous physicist in, but at the end of 40s, by political reasons, who was fired, he was fired. And in his laboratory were done the experiments on the use of semiconductors as a thermocouples to produce, to feed um, some old uh, um, radio sets. And um, uh, Joffe asked, the secretary of communist party of Leningrad to present such device. So uh, the kerosene lamp, which was a difference of temperatures between the glass and the body uh, feed it some thermocouple, which in its turn feed it radio. So this kerosene radio was presented to Stalin and Stalin told this is very important discovery because mm, every uh, pastor in the uh, or shipment, I don't know how to say in English, pastore in Italian, uh, in the mountains will be able to listen to the voice of Kremlin. And uh, Joffe was returned, he got uh, the laboratory, which then was transformed in, in Physical Technical Institute, where the laboratory of thermoelectricity was extremely, oh, sorry, uh, uh, oh, sorry, this is something uh, wrong. Uh, uh, yeah, 
Uh, 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 so, uh, yeah. And uh, in this laboratory, uh, we had done many interesting discoveries, theoretical discoveries and practical uh, in the field of thermoelectricity. Okay, I will proceed uh, then in physics, when uh, the Z coefficient can become giant and why it is important for fundamental research. Because uh, the, for, uh, the exist mod formula, which is more general than Kelvin one, which take into account, it says that Z coefficient is proportional to the derivative of logarithm of sigma over uh, chemical potential. And you understand that uh, sigma contains also information about scattering processes. And so every time when you have some singularity, strong dependence on chemical potential or uh, in uh, um, the, uh, so strong dependence on energy of uh, scattering, uh, um, the uh, z back coefficient can increase. This is, for instance, Kondo effect. This uh, is a topological transition. So when Fermi surface changes its uh, topology, uh, number of the, the components of connectivity. For instance, very recently, we with Alexander Pure did the study of transport spectroscopy of field induced cascade leaflet transitions. Today, in high, uh, in heavy fermion system, you can have even 15, 20 um, uh, closed transitions when Fermi surface changes topology. It is possible to study uh, by means of Z coefficient behavior and characterize these transitions. Uh, then, large role of thermoelectric effect in graphene. If we assume to use graphene in uh, some nano devices, it is necessary to be very attentive because of the large value of Z back coefficient and up to 30% of heat can be um, uh, released at the contacts. Uh, then uh, 20 years ago, the huge NERMS effect, so Z back in uh, or uh, hole effect in uh, thermal hole effect, uh, uh, the uh, was found uh, that in high temperature superconductors. So now I want to discuss what about the efficiency of thermoelectric device. Efficiency is determined as the energy provided to the load divided the heat energy absorbed at hot junction. And it is expressed in terms of so-called dimensional figure of merit, ZT, which is equal to conductivity of your sample multiplied square of Z back coefficient divided heat conductivity. So uh, if you make calculations, you will find some fundamental results that uh, the efficiency of thermoelectric device is a Carnot engine efficiency, T hot minus T cooler divided T hot. And the expression of ZT, you see that if ZT is small, so I will expand this term and unfortunately my efficiency will be very small. So it is not enough to have a large z coefficient. It is necessary to maximize also the, um, uh, 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 the figure of merit. But the obstacle is so-called for metals is wiedemann franz law because for metals or for doped uh, semiconductors we know that conductivity multiplied temperature divided heat conductivity due electrons is three E squared divided P squared. So if I include phonons, they do not help to conduct, but they will increase my denominator. So this factor will be even less than three E squared over P squared. This is an uh, obstacle. So how to decrease heat conductivity not touching heat conduct, uh, electric conductivity. So the device would be effective if ZT will be larger than four. Current records are around two. So in 90s, the new materials based on these ideas the, uh, and nanotechnologies, the new materials for thermoelectricity appear. So the main task was to increase figure of merit. The reduction of thermal conductivity is highly related to the material structure from atomic level features to meso and micro scale structures. It can be achieved by invoking all length scales in bulk thermoelectrics. 
This panoscopic tailoring of materials, microstructures, enhanced, enhances phonal scattering across different wavelengths, yet preserves their electronic transport, leading to high-performance thermoelectric materials. Heat-carrying phonons with short mean free paths can be scattered by nanoscale precipitates embedded in the matrix, and ones with long mean free paths can be scattered by controlling and fine-tuning the mesoscale architecture of the nanostructured thermoelectric materials. So in new materials for thermoelectricity, you can see which values already are rich, uh, um, achieved. Uh, in oxide compounds, whole uh, half houseland alloys, bismuth halcogenides, bismuth halcogenides nanostructured, and you see that uh, the numbers which I told are indeed reaching. Now, two words about magenta. Uh, so, ionic liquid based ferrofluids, it is colloidal suspensions of magnetic nanoparticles. To understand why we face with electrolytes, it is enough to take a look again on the, uh, the uh, um, uh, for Kelvin formula. S is proportional d mu over dt. When we speak with, with uh, when we uh, deal with degenerate Fermi system, this value is small. But in electrolytes, you deal with Boltzmann system and the formula for chemical potential is just minus T log concentration. And if you, model the electrolyte even as a uh, ideal gas with N1023, you will immediately see that we speak not about tens of microvolts, but we speak about millivolts. So immediately we gain two orders, we increase the coefficient in two orders, and the question is how to design these materials, how to make them uh, stable, uh, st stable and to use. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I hope that I'm in time. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Andre, for this uh, very interesting, I would say, is both histor historical and scientific overview about thermoelectricity. So as said by Daniele, so the, the question will be, for, uh, will be done at the end of the session. So, but in any case, I would like to invite all the attendees to write uh, if they have any question for Andre, please uh, write in the QE and a chat. And then at the, at the end of this uh, session, we will, uh, uh, Andre will answer your question. So, okay, so now, uh, thank you again, Andre. And then we can move to the second uh, speaker of uh, uh, this session, that is um, uh, Dr. Sako Nakamai from the uh, CA and the University of paris saclay in France. So uh, let me say that uh, uh, um, uh, Dr. S uh, Sako Nakamai is actually uh, a well-known researcher in the field of both uh, uh, magnetic nanoparticles and thermoelectric effect in liquid, li liquid electrolytes. Uh, so uh, currently she is the co-principal investigator of a European project that is actually focused on the Magenta project mentioned by Andre that uh, focus on uh, uh, thermoelectric ferrofluids and she also coordinator of a European joint program uh, named Advanced Materials and Processes for Energy Applications. So uh, today uh, um, Dr. Nakamai will give us a talk about the recent advancements in liquid thermoelectric research. So uh, please, Sako, the, the floor is yours. Sako? We cannot hear you. How about now? Okay, now we can hear you. Please. Okay, right. The connection sometimes goes with me. Okay, well, thank you so much for the organizers for inviting me among all these prestigious uh, speakers. I'm going to get right to my presentation. So, uh, I, since liquid thermoelectricity is not a subject widely known, even in the thermoelectric community, so I decided to give an uh, overview of what people are doing with these liquids. Uh, hold, how come it's not? 
Yes, here it is. So the, the, the creation of delta V uh, sub, when the material submitted under temperature gradient, the thermal electricity exists in liquids like it was presented by Professor. All liquids come from the fact that the entropy protection mechanism is more complicated, but there are more elements to it. Uh, there is a thermal galvanic, which is the electrochemical reaction effect, which is the equivalent to a solid state ZB coefficient that has just been described by my pre the previous presenter. There is also a thermal electrostatic effect that takes place. And if the charge carriers have some particular physical properties, such as super paramagnetism or optical absorptions, then all of these would play a role in production of entropy. So here I'm going to give an overview of what are the advantages and advancements that have been made in the large community of liquid dome electrics and some perspectives to conclude. So the advantages, which is, has also been mentioned first, is that liquids have very large ZB coefficient. When In the semicolon range of a couple hundred microvolt oven, liquids have usually minimum millivolt, if not close to 10 millivolt per Kelvin. And the other practical issues is that they are made with cheap and abundant copper or other organic molecules made of nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon. So they are very cheap. And they, with that comes, the, since we don't have any rare earth materials and such, they tend to be non-toxic and therefore they're ecologically friendly. And probably the first definite prototype showing how the thermal elect thermoelectric liquids in that back then there were only thermal galvanic cells was presented by the group of Quickenden and Vernon back in 1986, where they mixed ferro and ferrocyanide redox couple in water and they have measured significant measurable amount of electricity coming out of a cell. So the, the advantage aside, after that, there hasn't been much of uh, improvements in the thermal galvanic cells for about 20 to 15 years or so. And cells have very low conductivity because the conduction is done by the ions that are physically swimming through a body of liquid, and that's extremely slow. And with, as we use liquids, and liquids eventually they boil. Therefore, the temp operational temperature limit is also small. And combined together, it leads to a low efficiency. So this despite the fact that the ZB, the ZT, the dimensionless figure of merit becomes very small compared to the room temperature ZT. The record is around one point of magnitude smaller than the solid state counterpart. But go, sorry, just one thing. So your connection is not very good. Maybe you can close your video. Hello? Hello, Sako, can you hear me? Your connection is not perfect. Can ah, you okay. close your video? Just your, maybe we can improve a little bit. Thank you. Thank okay, you. I'm gonna try to move a little bit closer then. Okay, I hope you can hear me better. Okay, so as I was saying, so in order to overcome all these technical difficulties, the challenge name of the game now for the liquid thermoelectric materials is to increase the elect electrical conductivity, increase the operational temperature range, and while we are at it, why not increase the ZBIC coefficient? Uh, next slide, there you go. So there are basically what I see as a trend of three principal way of achieving these goals. One is to use a different type of liquids, most notably that of room temperature ionic liquids. So ionic liquids are molten salts, just like the table salt, but they are liquid in the room temperature and they remain room temperature until say 200, 300 C. 
this has two important implications for the thermal galvanic cells. One is that because the liquid is fully made of ions, their ionic conductivity is very high. And then because of the high boiling point, operational temperature ranges also increase. And an additional perk is that ionic liquids have very low vapor pressure and they're not toxic, so they can be exploited for the industrial and the mass deployment of the material. Next, very cl closely related to the use of ionic liquids is the development of new redox couples. So by changing the redox couples in transition metal ions, you can change the compl complexation of the ionic atmosphere around it, which can lead to the higher ZD coefficient. In addition to that, the many efforts are given to finding the redox couples that are highly mobile to improve, again, the conductivity of the thermal galvanic cells and also highly soluble so that we can increase the number of charge carriers. So those are from the materials point of aspects. And there are another important progress that has been made involves use of nanomaterials, either as a part of the device component or part of the liquid itself. The first example is that of electrodes. By introducing nanostructured electrodes, we can increase the active surface area of the electrodes and therefore the electrical resistance will be reduced. We can also, the, some people are also using the nanoporous or microporous separators inside of the thermal electric or thermal galvanic cells to prevent convective movements of the liquid. This would reduce the thermal conductivity. And last but not least, which is the focus of our projects in Magenta is the use of nanoparticles. The charged nanoparticles that are being introduced has a higher entropy and therefore the chemical potential dependence on temperature. And this can be used to play improving the ZD coefficient. So just to give you a couple of examples, uh, for the most advanced research in the liquid thermoelectrics right now is the use of nanostructured electrodes. So here are examples the use of multi-wall carbon nanotubes, either in the form of bucky paper or aligned in a nano carbon nanotube forced. So by using the bucky paper, the groups, the several groups were able to show that the power output from thermal cell can be improved by 30 to 50 percent. And by further aligning the, these carbon nanotubes, you can also again increase the power output by 30 percent. And at the moment, record power output you, from a liquid thermoelectric cell is about 12 watts per meter square at the total delta T temperature of 60 degrees. Of course, this was achieved in water. So in our group, and also with the collaboration with Magenta and, and other collaborative research projects, we are looking at another type of nanomaterials, which is the charged nanoparticle inclusion in the fluid. In, in not just any nanoparticles, but we use spare fluids, which is consisting of magnetic nanoparticles dispersed in non-magnetic media. And the, such liquid media, we include organic solvents, water, and ionic liquids. And their coating conditions are uh, varied from one sample to another. And we, of course, we add several different kinds of redox couples so we can generate electricity. And this is just a one example. And one of the latest one that we have from our project Magenta is that on the left is the plot of ZB coefficient as a function of nanoparticle concentration from zero to just 0.5% volume. We can see the improvement about 30% in ZB coefficients. And to the right is the maximum power output from the thermoelectric device. And again, the, on the x-axis is the temperature difference applied across the thermal cell. And from going with the lower curve combined together is that of the pure ionic liquids with just redox couples. And the higher value curves are that of the ionic liquids mixed with again 0.05% of magnetic nanoparticles. So although the exact physical mechanisms that is leading to the higher ZB coefficient and power outputs are yet to be 
discovered or be agreed upon, there is a clear evidence that, that by changing and controlling the surface condition and the material types and counter ions and all what goes in the thermoelectric cell, we can improve substantially the power output and ZV coefficient of thermoelectric cells based on liquids. So just to give you a few perspectives, the liquid thermoelectrics with the use of ionic liquids, new redox couples and nanomaterials, we are now entering the phase, leaving the phase of fundamental research and entering into the application of waste heat recoveries. So just within my lab, along with the Magenta, we started out with this simplified thermoelectric cell shown on the left. And now we are building the prototype for the demonstrators, micro generators for flexible and the room temperature use. And also soon we hope to bring out the prototype for the internal combustion engine cart. And right below is the group, another group that uses water-based thermoelectric cells, which has demonstrated that by using the temperature difference provided by a hand, so delta T of only about one to two Kelvin, they can generate measurable quantity of electricity. And the, also the, because of the, for now, the, as you have seen, the power output is very small. So there are also many movements to use this thermoelectric property of liquids into other application concepts. Here to the bottom to the right, I'm showing a sensor that uses the change in thermoelectric voltage due to the humidity and the pressure. They have created the temperature, pressure, and humidity triple sensors. So I hope that I was able to give you the, the enthusiasm that, that I have been the harm, the garnering in our lab and that this is active and very exciting field of research in physics, electrochemistry, the material science and whatnot. And I hope that in your future research projects, if you're looking for hybridization for the low temperature, the same 300 and less, you would think of the liquid thermoelectrics as a possible uh, hybridization path. So with that, I'd like to thank all of the audience for your attention and all of the project members, we are 10 in Magenta, and we have our Twitter account, YouTube account, website. So if you want to know what we are doing recently, please come and visit. And thank you again for your attention. And I give it back to you, Gaspari. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sako, for this very, very interesting uh, talk about thermoelectric liquids. So as before, I could tell all of you, so we will uh, shift the questions at the end of the session. But uh, uh, again, if someone from the attendees wants to make a question for uh, Sako Nakamai, please just write uh, them in the uh, Q&A chat. OK, so uh, now we can move to the last talk for this session, which will be given by Professor uh, uh, Liu from the Southern University of Science and Technology of China. So Professor uh, Liu have given a, a very significant contribution, I would say, both from uh, an academic and an industrial point of view to the de development of novel thermoelectric materials and devices. And today, Professor Liu will show us how uh, defect engineering can boost the thermoelectric figure of merit of magnesium uh, stenide compounds. So now I give the floor to uh, Professor Liu. Uh, so please, uh, you can show your results. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chair. Okay, let's uh, share the screen. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Mm, not yet. Okay, I will try again. No, yes. Okay, good. It's okay now? Yeah, now it's okay. Okay. Perfect. Uh, okay, hi everyone. Uh, I is delighted to be uh, to have this chance to uh, to share our work about it uh, on the thermoelectric material magnesium tin. Uh, my name is Wei Shu, just from uh, South Tech. 
um, I uh, similar tracker is a, a, a kind of a heat engine. It can direct can directly convert the heat into the electricity. Uh, theoretically, uh, the uh, the efficiency of this uh, uh, kind of a device is kind of related to the color efficiency and our material uh, figure of temperature ZT. Uh, strictly, if we consider our temperature dependent pro property uh, material. So it's, uh, it's strictly connected, we call it as the engineering ZT. However, for, um, for the material, the semiconductor uh, conduction is kind of a critical energy node for this kind of uh, heating uh, 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 similar to a power generator. So reducing the semiconductivity is, can, is a very important approach for the, uh, in this field. Uh, this is uh, the uh, uh, material ma magnesium T, it's a kind of a level band gap with a chemical structure. Usually we can use uh, antimony or business size or carrier, uh, carrier, carrier, carrier um, provider. So this is one of the, um, my previous two work. We, we, we can choose the, uh, where you can use uh, the alloy, uh, germanium alloy, at the gene site, we can increase the, the power factor in the larger range. And also, we also investigated the different kind of elements docking as a carrier provider. Uh, recently, we do some um, work. We added the more antimony in this magnesium chain site, usually for uh, for the for the for the carrier optimization, usually. People just add one percent antimony, but in our, our current experiment, we added almost fifty percent antimony in this magnesium chain compound. Uh, it is very uh, interesting. We we found it. Usually, we can say the antimony is kind of a little bit larger than the chain. However, in my experimental result, we uh, the from the XRD pattern, we calculate the light parameter. We see that after we add uh, more the antimony, we, we, we realized the light parameter is decreased. This uh, indicated some of the new defects, uh, magnesium and vacancy is appearing. We have more uh, evidence for this kind of, uh, for the existence of the magnesium vacancy. Here is the we measure the current concentration by the core on core coefficient measurement. So you can see at the low content of antimony docking side, we have the uh, current concentration is slightly increased and the ratio or saturated uh, value. And then you will see the current concentration will uh, decline as the uh, with the increasing antimony uh, content. This is this is just due to the uh, vacancy and uh, the vac the vacancy will be contributed some of the extra hold that uh, cancel out is the major carrier concentration. At the same time, we also measure the uh, the content by using the EPMA. We will see in our in our composition the uh, the real. Uh, content of the magnesium is uh, is uh, evaluated from a storage metric ratio. So uh, we know uh, we also calculated uh, if we in this kind of formula, we say they have some form of some of the magnesium vacancy. Now, if we consider um, the formation angle of the magnesium vacancy, we can calculate it. We were trying to fit in this kind of carbon concentration. However, if we consider consider constant deformation angle for this vacancy, we can we can we cannot use this kind of formula to fit in this experimental result. We need to use added some extra term, uh, like in the, like use like this kind of formula. It should have some of the term related to the content of antimony content. And then finally, we can obtain the, uh, well, the good in fading. That is means the formation angle of the magnesium vacancy is related to the, uh, the, the content of antimony. That means uh, if we also do some of the theoretical calculation to calculation this kind of 
the formation angle of this kind of defect pair. We have realized that when the distance of this uh, uh, defect pair is reduced, yeah, the formation angle is reduced. That is suggested uh, in, ours, uh, in our material, this kind of may have very complicated uh, such kind of defect pair. Uh, here is uh, the semiconductivity of this kind of material. We, was, we can see with the increased doping of antimony, uh, we will see the lattice semiconductor ratio is significantly reduced. Finally, the result is this material, uh, the lattice semiconductivity near the room temperature is, uh, is, is even lower than the, uh, than the reported uh, uh, magnesium chain alloy. So by consider the Cutaway's model, we can we can fit in this kind of the lattice uh, the the, the lattice semiconductor as a function of the antimony's content, and also we need to consider the contribution of uh, the magne uh, the magnesium vacancy. Generally, we can see due, uh, uh, the appearance uh, the appearance of magnesium vacancy and vacancy reduced the lattice semiconductivity. That is, can be considered as a uh, alloy effect. At the same time, we also do some of the phonon spectrum calculation for this uh, uh, material. If we consider the, the coexisting magnesium vacancy and also this kind of substitute uh, defects, uh, in this kind of uh, calculation, we were realized that the follow on, on velocity is reduced. Generally, in our, this kind of calculation that we consider the vacancy uh, is kind of, we can consider is kind of ordering compound between the magnesium chain and the magne magnesium antimonide. And at the same time, we also, we also see the disordering area effect also reduced the relaxed hand also contribute to the, the reduced the lighting system conductivity. However, we would, this uh, spectrum calculation shows that uh, the order structure also can contribute to the reduced the lighting system conductivity. Now we also have an open question. What is the exact uh, partial contribution to this uh, reduced the lighting system conductivity between the order structure or the disorder structure? Uh, this is uh, the same uh, property of this uh, 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 antimony doped magnetic compound. Due to the significantly reduced lattice system conductivity, this kind of will cause the compensation, compensatively doped magnesium chain. We can have the T value is 1.2. As compared with the normally doped uh, magnesium chain with only 1% antimony, uh, 0.7 at 400 degrees. The ZT value is increased in more than 70%. And uh, finally, we were trying to discuss one of the, uh, we call it the thermodynamic criteria of the alloy effect. Generally, we can say no matter uh, uh, the, uh, the appearance, the mag magnesium chain, uh, magne uh, the magnesium uh, vacancy, that is kind of of alloy effect that is that is significantly reduced in the light system conductivity. However, we would have, we would generally there have some of the question whether or alloy effect they could uh, really incre increases the figure of moderator and what's the optimized content. Uh, in my previous work, we have showed that the peak Z of a system or in or uh, uh, or uh, dual. Um, uh, space, the temperature and the character concentration. This kind of peak Z is related to a general uh, material parameter or we call it the B star. This kind of this B star is defined by the weighted mobility and the band gap and the, the light system conductivity. Now if we let it as the alloy effect uh, on the band gap, so this kind of uh, this this kind of benefits of the alloy effect will be reduced to this kind of uh, the change of the delta B. Then now in general, this kind of term is, is, uh, it can be uh, uh, related to this kind of, uh, uh, this by, uh, described by this formula. If we want to obtain the, the optimized content, generally we need to solve this equation. However, this equation cannot be 
are directly solved due to the content of this kind of arctangent and term. This question was first um, proposed in 2013 by A1. And uh, recently we solved this problem. We found a um, two piece, uh, or piece or piecewise function to replace this, uh, this term, arctangent um, term. And then finally, we can solve the, this kind of uh, uh, this problem to obtain the, the optimized uh, doping content in the two uh, situation. We define the parameter C and D. For this D parameter, we call it the, the flat action condition. When the D is less than the 16, we will have this kind of thermodynamic criteria. When this one is, for example, is less than, is less than one, that means uh, uh, this iron effect cannot be uh, uh, increased the ZT. If larger than the one, they op optimize the, the, uh, uh, the uh, doping is equal to the uh, 50%. In other side, for the strong fluctu uh, fluctuation condition, we also can have this kind of similar dynamic, dynamic criteria. That is also related to the two parameter D and the C. Finally, in different cases, we will also show this, uh, uh, the optimized uh, content. And my last slide, we will, we will give you a short and summarize. Uh, in, my, in, our, in our work, we have shown self-composition -com doping mechanism chain, have higher ZT values than the normally doping mechanism chain. And also, authentically reduced light semiconductor is observed as appearance to magnesium vacancy, which could be resolved both the early effect and the phono spectrum modification. And we also provide a thermodynamic criteria of the iron effect related to the thermal electric performance enhancement. Yeah, that's all. Thank you for attention. Okay, thank you very much. Professor Liu for this very interesting uh, uh, presentation about the use of um, defects to control or even better to, to increase the thermoelectric uh, figure of merit uh, of these compounds. So uh, this was the last uh, talk for this session. So now in principle, uh, the session is open for um, uh, discussion, but before starting the discussion, I would like to show uh, the results of the of the poll that I launched at the beginning of this um, session. So please, Emanuele, can you uh, show this uh, poll? Okay. Okay. So the question, just to repeat for someone, the question was how much energy produced by humanity was wasted as thermal losses? And uh, let's say that the majority of the attendees uh, answered 70%. And I have to say that is the, the right uh, answer, actually. So, but this is uh, quite not not surprising. But you can uh, easily imagine that it is a very huge number. So we have to say that three quarters of the um, energy uh, produced worldwide is wasted as thermal losses. So this is a uh, this this huge number. I have to say that um, uh, have pushed you know the uh, the scientific community to individuate. Uh, uh, some uh, uh, innovative technologies that uh, can use this uh, this kind of uh, this huge amount uh, of uh, energy source, you know, and uh, among, uh, let's say that uh, as was well explained by the previous speakers, among the different uh, uh, possibilities, uh, uh, probably thermoelectric uh, uh, materials is one of the uh, one is as a promising technology, let's say at least for a certain range of uh, temperature and. Uh, so uh, then uh, my, my idea now is to, to start from these results. There's that just to ask uh, uh, all uh, the speakers uh, uh, of this session, but also the other speakers uh, to try to add, uh, if, if they, uh, so try to add some more comments, let's say about the use of thermoelectric materials and especially focusing on the future perspectives and uh, and uh, directions and also if there are already some example where this these kind of technologies can be uh, used let's say in uh, combination with the other technologies to develop uh, uh, hybrid devices so after this kind of general question that i propose to 
Andre and also to Sako and to uh, Professor Liu, uh, of course, we can uh, do some specific uh, questions. There are also some questions in the QA uh, chat. So I, I don't know if someone want to add some comments about that. Andrei or Sako or Professor Liu about thermoelectric materials and the future directions and the perspectives? Oh, yeah, I, I, I just want to give a response to what you uh, raised about the, uh, uh, the application. And currently, the thermoelectric, uh, there are many actually, this field has been um, uh, rise up for almost 20 years. At the, at, the, at the beginning of this 20th century, there is uh, the, uh, the intensive interest in to just the harvest the waste heat, like it's car. However, currently this kind of technique is still cannot be real be used in the real cars, even or no, some of the just as the such uh, test, but uh, not a real being used within the city. I think that the most challenging part is uh, there is uh, there are the two sides. One is uh, the technical side for those kind of device assembling that is uh, especially for the high temperature application. The uh, the the uh, the interface is a very challenging part, and uh, especially. For this kind of metal and uh, uh, the join between the semiconductor and electric part, that kind of will become a, a very weak, especially at the high temperature. So the lifetime of this kind of high temperature semiconductor power generator is kind of a uh, technical challenge. This is the one side. Another more challenging part that is the economic side. Since uh, you can imagine such kind of, such kind of sandal car for the normal people, you drive maybe like a, just half an hour from your home to the working place, and then the car just parking in the parking lot, right? Generally, you not really been always be running. So the car needs are some of the some of the some of the opportunity for those kind of some of the generation for the waste heat harvest is for the truck. Our uh, current leader, I, I, I just know there are some of the, called the super truck project between the American and the China. Since the super truck, that is almost running every day, and even the day and the light. So that, that is a bit more powerful. Currently, it's easy to get the, like the over 1,000 thousand watt uh, um, for those kind of the truck set. Yeah, I think uh, it will be have some of the some kind of application in future, but uh, there is still limited by the efficiency and also the economic uh, consideration uh, concern. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Liu, for this uh, uh, very very nice uh, interesting comment. Okay, so I don't know if there are some other. Uh, Andre, we cannot hear you. You have to, maybe also I can. Uh, there is a button on the on the left corner. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, now it's okay. Yes, we can hear you, Andre. Okay, do you hear me? Okay, yeah. I just wanted to say that uh, one of the partners of Magenta Project is a Fiat Research Institute and. Uh, one of the goals of the project was to create a prototype. So the idea is that you can see at the streets hybrids. We are uh, habitual now to see Toyota hybrids, every um, the, uh, uh, large car producer produces some types of hybrids. So the idea is to uh, at least to transform and try it. So to use the heat of muffler, which is around 350 cal uh, Celsius, and the body of car, uh, let's say 50, so you have in your disposition 30, uh, 300 centigrade. 300 centigrade, and you want to have 12 volts. 12 volts. So you understand that um, it is enough to create uh, some thermo, uh, thermo generator, thermoelectric generator which will give you, let's say, uh, 40 milli 
volts per Kelvin, uh, 40, uh, uh, yes, 40, yes, 40. And uh, what means 40? It means 10 by four. So, and uh, Sako spoke about 1.7, 1.8, uh, Zbeck. So actually, uh, with uh, if we succeed to have uh, five millivolts per Kelvin, so it is enough to put ten cells uh, consequently, and you will have twelve volts uh, with a difference three hundred Kelvin. So this means that if you will be able to produce even one kilowatt, so you can feed your air conditioner free of charge, just recycling the heat, which you spoke about the 70%. Okay, so yeah. this is in small. Then I want to recall you that there is an inverse uh, uh, thermoelectric effect, Pelletier effect. So in principle, you can yeah. cool, uh, let's say, beer in, <laughs> uh, in thermoelectric cooler. Then I want to recall you all of that voyagers, which left our Earth and then now are all be, uh, beyond the limits of solar system, they are still fitted by thermoelectric effects, uh, thermoelectric generators. So actually there are some, uh, in some special cases uh, in airspace applications, uh, thermal electricity is already used. And indeed, uh, we had a lot of hopes with high temperatures, uh, with superconductivity. And something is done also in those way. Uh, I mean that 300,000 of houses at the Long Island are fitted by uh, high temperature superconducting cable. So science tries to, uh, and uh, I agree with you that thermoelectricity is extremely promising and uh, uh, in uh, green energy and all these things. So for instance, for me, it was a challenge and I'm very happy that I entered because I am a superconducting man, but uh, uh, I'm very happy that thanks to Magenta project and a little bit before, so I moved to this field and I uh, uh, um, uh, learned a lot. Then I wanted to answer on the questions in chat. Yes. So I, wa I was asked about the, I was asked about the uh, figure of merit, the, uh, uh, the possibilities uh, of the thermoelectric applications of graphene. Exactly. And yeah. I won't say that some time ago it was published a paper uh, of uh, people from uh, Colombia and Taiwan, uh, where they discussed the large thermoelectric figure of merit in graphene layer devices at low temperatures. Why? Because with graphene, it, it, in the plane, it has very high conductivity, but unfortunately, also very high uh, uh, heat conductivity. So uh, the problem of um, denominator and figure of merit so how to decrease heat conductivity, people resolve in the same way. So for figure of merit ZT, which is sigma, they use high sigma of graphene. S square, as uh, I calculated myself, it, uh, um, uh, it can reach uh, 30, 40 uh, uh, microvolts per Kelvin. So this is a larger than for bismuth, but still not like in good semiconductors. Nevertheless, it is high. Uh, and they, uh, what they did, uh, they, so graphene exhibits a high electrical conductivity that is necessary for high ZT. However, this effect is countered by its impressive thermal conductivity. So uh, people in this work, which I cite, they created a layer device so composed of electrochemically exfoliated graphene and a phonon blocking material such as some, I don't remember terrible chemical things like pollen, any line, I don't remember. Um, so the figure of merit was reached, I think around uh, two, maybe two and a half. So it is already very good. And then the other question was about topological insulators for thermoelectricity. Um, uh, it is interesting. Uh, also, you can find the review article of our Chinese colleagues from Nanjing University, if I remember well, where topological insulators, uh, they demonstrated that 
uh, topological insolence have a tremendous potential. Um, and uh, actually, um, uh, uh, their unique boundary states that are topologically protected against backscattering, uh, um, they uh, have, in some sense, the same characteristics as the excellent thermoelectric materials. So, for instance, they share similar material features, such as heavy elements and narrow band gaps. So, um, if I remember again well, uh, ZT was again between one and two. So, these materials do not provide you for desirable, but good two they provide. Okay, I hope that I answered on the, the questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrei. It was really clear, I guess. So, uh, I, I, I mean, I don't know if there are uh, some other questions for the other speakers. Uh, I have just a, a question for uh, Sako, just a curiosity. Can you hear me, Sako? Yes. Yes, just a curiosity, uh, Sako. So you speak about, uh, you spoke about uh, liquid uh, um, ionic mm -hmm. liquid. So my question is, uh, is possible also to think about uh, ionic gel instead of ionic liquid for this kind of devices in order to have something that is, let's say, more solid? Yes. There yes. are groups, there is an active group in Sweden, for example, they are working on gels and all sorts of uh, um, liquid crystals. Okay, 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 thank you very much. I saw that there is uh, one more question for Professor Liu. I can try, Professor Liu, can he hear me? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, I just see the question. Can yeah, you the, question? the question? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So you, can re you can read the question uh, and then uh, answer if you... Okay, okay. Yeah, the question is in your hybrid approach. What do you um, what do you imagine um, could be the target in perspective for the magnesium being based thermoelectric tricky material? Uh, you means that the hybrid approach uh, is uh, means the order structure and the disorder structure, right? So actually, we this is a very uh, is a, is a kind of question we arise. That we have. So far, we don't have the answer. Um, it's very complicated since in our, uh, uh, in our current understanding, since the defects could form a different kind of the def defects cluster. So currently, we have, didn't have the enough tools to really know what kind of cluster the structure they have. So that is, we have no idea how to do the next step. So we are trying to um, get some of the information from like uh, the theoretical calculation, like uh, the uh, monocular dynamic calculation, but however, the result is so far is still too complicated for us to really be um, getting inside. Okay. So thank you. I think that we have to stop here this session because we accumulated some delay, but it was so interesting that it was difficult to stop all of you. And then, but now I pass again the, the floor to, to Daniele for the last session. And thank you again for all, to all the speakers of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gaspari. And, uh, and thank all, to all the speakers. Um, let's go to the third session uh, focused on thermoelectric, hybridization of thermoelectrics and uh, fermionic. Uh, before starting, I would like to launch the last poll. Uh, so the, the poll number four for the technical direction. Uh, yes, which will be the key, uh, obviously to, to this, the, the, there is no a correct answer, which will be the key tool to make thermoelectric and or fermionic energy converters competitive and broadly diffused. Uh, development of advanced materials, application of nanotechnology, introduction of new device structures, hybridization of the conversion mechanism. Please uh, um, answer to, 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 to this question and uh, uh, in uh, half a minute uh, we will compare your opinion.
okay Let, let's see the, the 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 answers the statistics oh it's interesting that uh, hybridization also in this case uh, could be uh, the, 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 the key tool in order to, to, to make uh, uh, thermoelectric or fermionic uh, um, competitive and broadly diffused. The, um, this is uh, also my, my opinion. Okay, uh, let, let's uh, start with the first speaker, uh, Giuseppe Romano from MIT, research scientist at MIT and principal investigator of the NASA JPL project on the development of next generation radioisotope uh, um, thermonetic generators. R uh, recently, he released the, the open source package OpenBT for simulating thermal transport across different length scales. Please, Giuseppe, you can start. All right. Thank you for the invite. And I'm very excited about uh, talking this, this uh, new development that is been uh, Carry uh, on in a group in a modern internal transport about uh, different land scales, as has been discussed uh, previously. Uh, having a lower thermal conductivity with respect to the bulk phase can have important uh, effects of the increase of heat. Okay? And uh, one of those, uh, uh, one of the most promising approaches is created by nanotests, right? And, and, and as you can see here in this figure, uh, the, 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 the thermal conductivity decreases significantly with respect to the bar for different structures. Here we have the specific on the red curve, okay, and here we have the curve for different structures. When it comes to modeling these structures, the simplest approach that one can take is, is assuming that the boundary scattering, the, 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 the scattering time with the boundary is simply given by the magnitude of the visualized of a physical form divided by the characteristic length. But the problem is the characteristic length is not easy to be identified. In a thin film, yes, it can be the thickness of the, of, of the film. The nanowires can be the diameter, but how about here in nanoprotein field? So we really have to take an approach that can include the complexity of the geometry. And this approach has been uh, widely used in, in, in uh, other traditional disciplines, which are kind of elements or kind of volumes in this course. Uh, thermal transport in complex geometry following the field has like, been modeled for decades during different parameters, for example, comps, for example, and here we would like to compute the atomic size effect. And for you to go beyond the field theory, Giuseppe, have, Giuseppe uh, sorry, yes. sorry for the interruption. Could you. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, a bit a bit because the, 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 there is some noise uh, in the audio. No, uh, uh, ah, okay, if okay. you could, okay. Because um, the, 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 the... Let's go, okay. Is it better now? Yes, a, a bit better, yeah. A bit better, no good, but better. Is it yeah, Okay, better, better, yes, okay. It's sufficient, okay, good, yes. all right. Okay, so we need the, to move sorry. beyond uh, uh, standard diffusive theory. Uh, and the model of choice in this case is the phonon bottom of transport equation. Here, what you can see is the steady state form or the DTE. On the left side, we have the drift component and on the right side, we have the scattering component. The drift component, so uh, F lambda is in non-equilibrium phonon distribution for a phonon mode lambda that collectively describes the phonon uh, wave vector and, for, and, and polarization. Here, F zero is the equilibrium distribution at a given temperature. And lambda, uh, omega lambda lambda prime is the scattering operator. Those uh, contributions are computed by force principle calculation. Okay, for example, that's density functional theory. Uh, this equation is a little bit complicated, a convoluted. So, thankfully, for most materials, we can use the so called um, um, relaxation time approximation, where we assume that the scattering operator is diagonal. And so, here we have the relaxation time approximation of the DT. Okay, it goes here in the right in, in, the, in the bottom side of the slide. All right, so the goal is to model heat transport across any scale and using DFP or you know first principle data as an input. Uh, this is a little complicated because we have to solve this equation. Maybe in our case, we solve it deterministically, and and there are two main challenges. The first challenge is why in wide material materials, 
we need an ultra fine mesh. And this is very complex in Gorsan matrix. It is as large as the, 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 size, the, the number of elements of our mesh. And so we fix this problem by identifying a, a modified Fourier law that can be employed for short mystery path phonons. Okay, so so what, what we do at the end, I'm, I'm not giving here details. We, so here we identify three regions for phonons, distributed phonons, ballistic phonons, and quasi-ballistic phonons. And also and those three regions are computed differently. Okay. Yet we still have to face another challenge. Uh, we have a large number of phonon modes coming from from, from the CP, it easily can be 100 or 1,000 moles. So, and we can invert matrices, uh, so many matrices, right? I mean, we can do, but it can be a computational challenge. The way we do it is we reframe the RCA model by uh, collectively describing the collectively describing the scattering time and the group velocity by the, the, the uh, uh, yeah, and we translate those two factors into the vectorial mean tree path here. And here we can see the f, the f lambda is a smooth function of f. So the means that we can rely on interpolation. So instead of solving the BT for thousands of modes, we solve it only for sort of modes that are uh, for specific that are uniformly distributed in a in a sphere, and then we compute the effective term of conductivity simply by doing linear interpolation. And this allowed us to simulate uh, structures that go really from the nanoscale all the way to the macro scales. So to summarize, uh, this F for software OpenBT uh, has three main components, the DFT driver. We, of course, we, we didn't develop the DFT package because it has been done by other, so, uh, other software, so we call Phantom Express, so, so bad. And we have the driver to include, to include the data, and then we have this hybrid BT Fourier model that can, uh, with no input parameters, can, uh, rather than, of course, the, 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 the DFT data and the geometry, can add to the effective term of conductivity. So here we have the documentation of of the code later is the design I can do a little bit uh, I can I can you can do a little bit of uh, yeah. we can go to an exchange. All right. So the goal is so thanks to this approach we can simulate structures like this on our lab. And then uh, and, and then here on the right side we see the so-called domain decomposition of the structure where we identify phonons which are ballistic they cover ballistically infusely or following or quasi or quasi ballistic. And as you can see, the BT region is just a little fraction of the whole phone population. That means that the actual BT is solved only in this case for the 20% of the mold. Uh, and and that, that, that is the, the, the actual reason why we can solve this situation. It seems complicated on our lab. So this is a step toward democratization of phone transfer calculation. There is, there is also a cloud version I'm going to talk about that soon. All right, so um, now it's time, I think, uh, to talk about experimental validation. So we have this code, but that is quick experiment. So we started engaging in experimentalists. So we had to, we had to um, collaboration with Professor Kenny Wilson, who was back in 2018 at uh, uh, Stanford. So in the first case, we simulated, uh, and so we investigated some of the uh, serpentines here, and we had fairly good agreements with experiments and the same thing here with silicon nanobridges. And here we have a, a, a recent collaboration with, uh, with the Professor uh, Nelson and Steve Curry from the Institute uh, in the Institute Catalan, the nanotechnology. And, and then here also, uh, here we study thermal transport across force materials. And again, we find good, good agreement with experiments. So we are more important to so also benchmark our data against Monte Carlo simulation. All right, so um, now that we have this tool to be fast, uh, or relatively fast, we are able to run a large number of simulations, right? And so the first thing that one can think of is to uh, so, and embed this in an AI pipeline. So this is just AI, this is just an ongoing work uh, funded by uh, MSC at the Boston AI Lab. So the whole goal here, the, the, this project is led by my sister, Sarah Kaniche. And so the whole goal here is is to have okay so we have a four material and 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 then we visualize this material with four coordinates and we feed the, those those numbers into a an artificial neural network and the neural network then will be trained with a supervision with supervised uh, learning will be trained in order to mimic this system we can use a surrogate model 
instead of the DC for, for import reform. So this is an ongoing collaboration uh, with IBM and this project with Professor Tim Johnson and Raul Rabinski. Fired us and Mr. Uh, uh, from IBM. Um, another project that I, uh, I feel compelled to mention is a 2D materials. So, uh, as, so the RTA approximation works well with a uh, with materials like silicon, but notoriously fails with two dimensional materials, for example, graphene. So we really had to go back uh, to the original DT equation and we had to show. Uh, uh, without aligning on the fact that the diagonal operator, the, 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 the scattering operator is the diagonal one. And here we have a set of some of the versus different landscapes. And, and as you can, for course material, and as you can see, the effective of thermal conductivity is way larger when we include, with respect to the RTA, when we include uh, 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 the two scattering operators. Okay? So that means that we really need to employ the two DC. And this is an ongoing project, uh, and, and hopefully now we can go beyond that. You know, and it's, it's that as we, uh, as has been mentioned before, as a very, uh, as very large electroconductivity, so we have to go to other materials, uh, if they want to be materials. All right. So I, uh, I have a, uh, so this is not the last slide. This slide is the last slide, but it's not the last thing we have do today. So let's acknowledge my, my group. If you are interested uh, in getting to uh, you know our group better, please send me an email. Also, if you want to uh, need some help in using the course. And soon we're going to have our, our workshop. Um, so uh, we'll see in the loop. Uh, before leaving you guys, I'm going to show a little bit uh, of, of a tutorial. So now, thankfully, we can run uh, this simulation in the cloud. So so this is the, the documentation. And then you click here, call up, and then here. Right? So that means that you just have, you need to have a Google account and soon. Also, the code we have GPUs and Google offer uh, uh, free GPUs. So after some uh, comments, we install the code. Uh, so here we have three main component, components: the material, in this case, get the data from the database, which is this one. And now we have silicon, and then and then we have a, the geometry. The geometry is pretty comprehensive. We can have different geometries. And different shapes, and, and in this case, we have two shapes, circle and, and square, and then we can solve it, and then we get to know, uh, and then we can receive the perspective sum of the two. And here we have, so here we have the the, the, the visualizer, and the number of here is not clear, but it's, the bulk is 160, it's a little bit overestimate, uh, yeah, or bulk number of the The single example can come from the principle, the Fourier one is 432 watts and meters Kelvin. Korea is one of the most high structure of the and then the DT is 14, the, uh, around 14 watt per meter. So there is a, in this case, more than one of the magnitudes to pressure in the thermal core conductivity. And then we can go also uh, to other examples, it's more, a little bit more complicated, where we have cast of shapes. Here we have this, 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 uh, this shape. And okay, so this is the cloud, but still here you have to code a little bit. So how about we go directly to a web app where we can uh, in this case, only simulate, but hopefully in the future, sorry, visualize, hopefully in the future we can also simulate uh, thermal transfer here without knowing how to code. Uh, uh, so, and then yeah, I just put online this, 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 this OpenDT web app, and here is a case where we combine the best of both worlds. So, a low thermal conductivity material to internalize with one of the optimized structures, right? And then we have this, uh, this uh, nano patterning, and here the back is 1.6. Four watt in the Kelvin and the DT is 0.17 watt in the uh, watt per meter, uh, meter Kelvin, which is a value that can also compete a little bit with the heat fired by uh, electrons. And here we can select the different points. So we have the, the temperature of Korea, for example, uh, or how uh, let me see. So we have uh, okay. So this is the thermal flux magnitude computed by the DT, and this is the thermal flux. Magnitude computed by by a Fourier. Okay, the Fourier thing I'm not in the values. Okay, but more importantly, the DT here, the Fourier has a more like uh, corner effect, uh, and and this is an effect that is a little bit less pronounced with the, with the DT. This is a little bit uh, so the scale is not the same. Okay, and, and then and then yeah, 
So hopefully soon we will have also the possibility of running this in the cloud, not only visualizing. Um, I'm currently using the graphical integration interface, so we're going to have an end to end uh, simulation for you. So uh, I think I'm done. Uh, how are we with time? I think it's good, right? Ten minutes. Okay. Right? No. Okay. Uh, all right. All right. Uh, Thank you, Giuseppe. Thank you for uh, the, the very interesting presentation. Let's go to the second speaker, uh, Bruno Lorenzi, uh, who received the, the PhD in material science at uh, the University, of, uh, University Bicocca of Milan. Uh, his main interests are in the combination of thermoelectric and photovoltaic effect. Uh, for this topic, he obtained a Marie Curie uh, Fellowship uh, for developing this topic at the at MIT. Okay, Bruno. Uh, yeah, the, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman, for the introduction. Uh, I'm very honored to be here among uh, these speakers, and uh, I thank the organization committee for inviting me to this uh, colloquium. And I also want to thank all the audience out there. So today I'm going to talk about um, hybrid thermoelectric photovoltaic uh, systems. And um, uh, this project was um, in the framework of uh, a Marine, Marie Curie Individual Fellowship. And uh, I'll talk about later about uh, the framework of the project. So let's jump to the motivation of this project. So why we wanted to uh, uh, study and develop hybrid uh, photovoltaic thermoelectric generators. So the answer is very simple actually, because um, you may know that uh, uh, actual solar cells are not that efficient. So if you think just to put a number that uh, uh, the best uh, silicon solar cell has only 25% uh, of efficiency. That means that uh, at least for single junction cells, um, up to 75% of the uh, power coming from the sun is lost in, uh, in the device. So, and I can tell you that uh, uh, most of these loss, uh, most of these lost power is in the form of heat uh, in the solar cell. And that's why actually solar cell eat up during operation. So here I show you an example of uh, the delta T between the solar panel and the ambient temperature as a function of uh, the radiation level in different uh, location in Switzerland and Germany, uh, and depending on also the kind of mounting of the solar panel. So in solar cells, you have uh, both ingredients you need for a uh, thermoelectric heat recovery. So uh, you have a delta T and you also have uh, an amount of heat to be recovered. So it's pretty straightforward to think that you can hybridize and you can utilize thermoelectric generator in order to um, recover heat from solar cells. Uh, so the, the practical development of these um, uh, devices is not that simple, and there are a bunch of uh, strategies and the concept out there. So here I show you the example of our strategy, our concept. Uh, we basically wanted to work with uh, uh, wide gap solar cells, and I'll tell you why later. And um, uh, we want to use a thermoelectric generator, which is uh, attached to the solar cell, so thermally coupled with the solar cell. And uh, the whole system is evacuated in a, in a uh, pipe. And also uh, the um, uh, cold side of the thermoelectric uh, generator uh, was cooled down by a liquid uh, uh, refrigeration uh, fluid. So um, in the next slides, I want to uh, tell you and what you, I want to tell you why we wanted to use wide gap solar cell and the reason behind uh, the fact that you want to use uh, thermal coupling and not other kind of uh, strategies. And then I'll show you, of course, the, the result we got. So uh, the first question is why uh, wide gap solar cells? So the reason behind this choice is uh, uh, the uh, efficiency behavior of solar cells versus temperature, uh, which is the green line here. Uh, so normally in solar cells, uh, so the efficiency of solar cell decrease uh, if you increase their temperature. 
And uh, in most cases, uh, this decrease is linear. So you have a linear decrease, so you can define a slope of the efficiency versus uh, temperature. And um, so uh, this slope is a key parameter uh, because uh, it, it enters in the, uh, in the way how you calculate the efficiency of the hybrid device, which is uh, basically the sum between the thermoelectric generator efficiency and the uh, photovoltaic efficiency. So uh, what happens from the physics of solar cell is that uh, for wide gap solar cell, this slope is smaller. So they decrease, they, are, they have a less uh, temperature sensitivity. And if you uh, put all the information about the material and your device in a model as we did uh, 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 some years ago, you find that basically uh, you have, if you uh, thermoelectrically hybridize a, a solar cell, you just have a, a positive efficiency gain only if you work with a, a solar cell based on uh, uh, materials with energy gap higher than more or less 1.5 electron volts. So that means that, uh, for example, in this graph, um, all the materials, all the photovoltaic materials that has, uh, that are on the left of this uh, red line, are uh, are not suitable for thermoelectric hybridization. And unfortunately, also uh, silicon is there. But you end up with a bunch of material on the right of uh, this uh, red line. Uh, and um, in particular, we have we choose to work with perovskite, gallium indium phosphide, and amorphous silicon. We choose to evaluate these uh, materials, and um, that's the reason basically why we wanted to work with wide gap solar cell because only wide gap material uh, are suitable for thermoelectric materials for thermoelectric hybridization. So the other question is, so why bother? I mean, uh, why, uh, if the, the solar cell sensitivity to temperature is a problem, why not to use a spectrum splitting approach? And uh, in this case, you can use a beam splitter and separate the, the spectrum, the solar spectrum, and direct a part of the spectrum on the thermoelectric generator and the other on the solar cell. So th this is, an, is uh, of course, an approach. And I would say, more or less half of the research uh, on these uh, hybrid uh, devices is dedicated to spectrum splitting approach. Uh, but I think we have shown pretty clearly that uh, this is not a winning approach. And I'll tell you why in the, in, uh, the next slide. So here I show the uh, spectral distribution of thermal losses in solar cells. And uh, I show you here uh, three examples, silicon solar cell, CIGS solar cell, and triple junction solar cell in order to cover more or less all the generation of uh, kind of solar cells. And you can see that basically uh, the uh, thermal losses are equally distributed over the whole bench, uh, the whole uh, spectrum of the interested by the solar uh, spectrum. That means if you put a beam splitter here, normally it's around one uh, micrometer, um, your thermoelectric generator can assess only this part of uh, the thermal losses. But as you can see here, this is only a very uh, small fraction of the whole uh, thermal losses. This means that with um, spectrum splitting approach, you can recover, or you can recover only 20 to 30 percent of the thermal losses. This means that you end up with a small uh, efficiency gain. That's why we wanted to use a thermal couple approach to uh, th the thermoelectric generators attached to the uh, solar cells. So, and then, um, so we um, acquired uh, three kind of solar, wide gap solar cells amorphous silicon perovskite and gallium indium phosphate. And we characterize their efficiency uh, as a function of temperature and also a different uh, uh, optical concentration. And the only thing here uh, that I want to point out it, uh, is the peculiar behavior of perovskite solar cell that uh, instead of decreasing versus temperature, they have a, a small increase and then they start to decrease. And this uh, was uh, already reported by other studies. So we found more or less the same behavior. And also we characterize the emittance of the solar cell and the reflectance. Uh, the emittance because you want to know uh, uh, the radiative heat losses from your solar cell and the reflectance because you want to evaluate how much of the solar, the solar power 
actually enter your system. So we took this characterization and uh, we put uh, these uh, numbers in our model. And here I show you um, the efficiency of the hybrids, the pre predicted uh, efficiency of the hybrid for the three material that we've ch uh, chosen. So, and here you can see basically that uh, for all materials, as expected, you have a, a positive efficiency gain. So you have an increase of the efficiency versus temperature. All uh, the cases have a, a maximum uh, for different uh, uh, optical concentration. And at the maximum is where uh, the, is basically defines an optimal uh, working temperature for your device. And uh, to just uh, make a, sh a short, uh, very long story, we end up, we uh, choose the perovskite solar cell to work with, especially because as you can see here, um, the optimal temperature is, uh, um, is uh, not that high, meaning that uh, you can work a uh, temperature that are normally uh, experienced by uh, solar cells. While, for example, instead for gallium indiophosphide, you have to go to very high temperature in order to have the maximum uh, uh, output power. So we choose to work with uh, perovskite and to do, develop our devices. And um, so we took um, um, uh, bismuth telluride wafers and uh, basically we cut uh, our legs, which were um, optimized. The dimension of the legs were optimized in order to make the system work at the optimal temperature. And then we develop a, a very tiny uh, thermoelectric generator, uh, an optimized thermoelectric generator. And um, first of all, of course, we have uh, uh, characterized our thermoelectric generator, which was working as expected. And, and uh, here there is uh, the IV curve. So in order to um, uh, evaluate the internal resistance of the thermoelectric generator, which is very small, I would say. Um, then we put our uh, thermoelectric generator in a vacuum chamber with uh, on top the perovskite solar cell. And we characterize uh, this device uh, as a function of uh, uh, the under uh, solar simulator. Of course, we, um, we took, uh, and this is um, the IV curve uh, under solar simulator and at uh, maximum temperature because of course the when you shine light on uh, the device there is a transient behavior and uh, you can reach the maximum and then uh, you can uh, uh, do your IV and evaluate the power output of your device and here is um, um, the final uh, efficiency gain that we were able to achieve with our hybrid perovskite uh, thermoelectric uh, generator. And for um, uh, 5%, 5, uh, for an con optical concentration of 5, we reached uh, around 3% of net efficiency gain. And this was the result of our work. And so this is also the end of my talk. I just want to thank my sponsor, which is the uh, Marie Curie uh, uh, Action. And uh, I want also to thank my two uh, supervisors, Professor Naducci from uh, University of Milano Vicocca and uh, Professor Gan Chen uh, at the MIT. And I thank all of you for the uh, attention. Thank you very much, uh, Bruno. Let's pass uh, uh, shortly to, to the next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Alireza Noget. Uh, who received uh, his PhD from Stanford University in 2006 and has been uh, with the British uh, uh, Columbia University since then, uh, where uh, he is a professor in the, the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, his re research uh, topics uh, interest is on the interaction of electrons and photons with the nanostructures, emission uh, phenomena, vacuum nanoelectronics, and energy conversion. In 2016, he chaired the uh, 29th uh, International Vacuum Nanoelectronics Conference. Please, uh, Alireza, uh, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Daniela, for your very kind introduction. Let me share the screen. Um, is it working? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so 
Okay, um, thank you. So uh, let me start by uh, also thanking Daniele and uh, Gaspare and uh, their colleagues for this opportunity to be here. I'm delighted. And um, I'd also like to thank all the individuals uh, that uh, whom I've had the good fortune of working with over the years. And of course, our sponsors, and of course, everyone who's out there uh, listening. And uh, so actually, just quick question. Uh, do you have my, my slides uh, covered with with my Zoom screen, or do you have the full slide? Yes, we do the, the full screen. We, we see the full okay. screen. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so um, maybe just a quick, um, uh, very brief overview of thermionic energy conversion. Um, we've just been listening to a lot of discussions about thermoelectric devices. And uh, earlier, we had an introduction to thermionics. So just quick review that a thermionic device is essentially the same concept but you want to get rid of the, the phonons that are going from the hot to the cold side or you know, other ways of direct um, conduction of heat. And so you replace the material with a vacuum. Of course, you get rid of the phonons, um, but you still have to deal with other forms of energy transfer, in particular, um, in the form of thermal radiation. And so this is a static heat engine with all the kind of advantages that we expect and uh, have been discussed so far. Um, I thought I'd give a very brief historic overview of uh, kind of how or, or um, where, where things have been going. Uh, we've known about this concept for about well, over 100 years now. And um, there was a, a huge amount of activity, uh, maybe about 50 years ago, um, especially by the, the space programs. And so this was a hot topic. And uh, there was a, you know, the, the classic textbook of the topic was uh, published then. And this, this sort of um, went on, uh, saw a few waves of interest, but then gradually sort of, sort of died down. And there was even this report 20 years ago that kind of suggested maybe this is not going very far. And it's been interesting to see a resurgence of activity in the past um, 10 to 15 years. And um, for instance, NASA started looking at this again. And this has been partly stimulated, I think, by, by a lot of advances uh, in other areas that have led to then new concepts, new ways of simulating things, new device structures that have been proposed, like the field emission heat engine, uh, ways of combining the effect of light and heat, um, and, 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 and then, and of course, phenomena in nanostructures. And, and so there is even, uh, there are well, two startups that I know of that are pursuing various forms of thermionic conversion. And uh, so, so the field has become active again. But what's interesting to me is that, um, you know, this, this is such a basic concept, but there are still many things that we don't know about it. And, you know, we, we expect to get very close to the thermodynamic limits, but, but, you know, how far have we gotten in practice? And, you know, the, the practical efficiencies have hovered around 10%, and we've known that for, for a long time. But why are we not doing better? And so I think to, to me, there are a lot of questions there. That, uh, that relate to physics and materials. And um, so, so again, this is a remarkably simple device, right? Just two electrodes, it doesn't get any simpler than that. Uh, but the physics turns out to be remarkably rich and, and complex. So for instance, if you wanted to, to analyze a thermionic device, uh, you have to deal with all these phenomena having to do with the electron emission, transport, thermal conduction, thermal radiation. and um, just by looking at the, the names of scientists, uh, famous scientists, all of whom we know, uh, that I've highlighted in red here, uh, we can uh, get a feel for how many different phenomena are, are involved. And, and there are more things to be considered even. And uh, so all of these things have to be considered simultaneously. And just to highlight one example, you know, the space charge effect, that's one of the, the key um, issues, one of the key challenges. Um, which is the, the fact that once electrons are emitted from the hot cathode, um, now there's this negative cloud that prevents or hinders further emission. Well, that in itself is an age-old topic. And, and there's this uh, recent review uh, that's, that I highly recommend. It's very interesting. Um, and puts this in, in context and uh, in, in terms of the, the electronics, uh, various electronics applications. And it's a, an extremely complex phenomenon in itself. And that's just one of the many things to discover or, or to, to take into account. Um, now, what I'd like to 
point out is um, some of the works of uh, Ehsan Rahman, who is a, a brilliant PhD student, who has um, put all this physics together. And, and, and I should say there, there are a lot of other uh, works out there, um, some by people whom we have uh, at this colloquium. And um, looking at various parts of that physics. And so, so gradually we've grown to include more and more and almost all of them uh, to varying degrees of approximation and um, to, to analyze devices like this, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a thermionic device, or for that matter, uh, if we wanted to add the second cycle, a thermoelectric device, um, obviously we all here uh, feel that uh, hybrid or combined conversion technologies are, are an important way to go. Um, so if we wanted to analyze something like this, putting these physics together, we'll see interesting effects like this, for instance, and maybe I can use a laser pointer. Um, what I'd like to highlight is that if you look at uh, the, the temperature of the emitter uh, under a fixed amount of input uh, energy, and that could be the case, for instance, if, if you're dealing with solar, uh, let's say concentrated solar, if you have fixed power input, as opposed to um, an infinite reservoir of waste heat where you would have a fixed temperature. But let's say if you have fixed power input, uh, as a function of the distance between emitter and collector, uh, you see how the temperature of the emitter could change. But perhaps more interestingly and uh, less intuitively as a function of the voltage applied between the two or, or extracted from the device, uh, the emitter temperature can change enormously. And this is something that's, that's not maybe intuitive. And, and this is an example that highlights the importance of treating all this physics simultaneously. Um, now, you know, this, this, this can be applied then to find the, uh, the peak efficiency, the optimal distance between the electrodes and, and get a feel for the kind of efficiencies that one can obtain uh, using, for instance, a, a, an individual thermionic device or combining with a thermoelectric device. Um, so, so this is all the outcome of putting this physics together. Now, what I'd like to emphasize is that um, really to get that kind of efficiency and, and, and better and better and to, to get closer to the thermodynamic limits, we need to be able to tune the material properties. And before that, we have to know all the material properties. And even for bulk materials, you know, over a wide range of temperature, especially at high temperatures, a lot of the optical and electronic properties are not well known. And um, for nanomaterials, things become even more challenging and uh, there are even more unknowns. And um, then they also give us uh, new physics. So there's a lot of room um, to to do things there. And so here I've just given uh, a few examples of some of the fundamental issues that one, one has to deal with. For instance, if you look at the thermal conductivity of nanotubes, which are one of the you know, key material perhaps in the 1, 1D world, um, you can essentially find any, any value depending on the, the sample uh, type and, and structure. Um, the form of thermal radiation um, is essentially unknown for, for low dimensional materials. There's a lot of work, of course, we all know that we are talking about deeply sub wavelength structures. And, and so we can't expect to uh, see the same behavior as a, as, as a bulk uh, black body, but, um, but we don't really have complete solutions for what it should look like. And, and similarly for thermionic emission. And one thing I'd like to highlight is the, the importance of the energy distribution of the emitted electrons and photons. Um, and all these, uh, which, which have been alluded to earlier uh, uh, this, this morning or, or today by Antonio and, and, and Andre and others. And um, so again, just to highlight an example here of something maybe non-intuitive, uh, this very nice paper uh, last year that, um, that predicts that you should be able to see uh, signatures of the Luttinger liquid behavior of carbon nanotubes in, in their high temperature thermal radiation. And you know, it's interesting because when you talk about Luttinger liquids and so on, typically people think about low temperature physics, you know, strongly correlated systems and so on. But, but there is uh, much to be said about uh, such uh, effects in, in these you know, really novel material systems at high temperatures. And this is the kind of things that one has to, um, to take into account. Um, now, I, uh, Daniele, if I have uh, a couple more minutes, I would uh, talk a little more. If not, if you want me to stop here. Yeah. No, no, okay, okay, please, please continue. Yeah, okay, thank you. So, so um, 
then I, I'd like to switch gears uh, a little bit and talk about one specific uh, thermal effect in, in these um, uh, nanomaterials, car carbon nanotubes uh, specifically, that, that we've been uh, involved with uh, for, for a while now. And um, it's, it's this phenomenon uh, that I'm showing here. So if you look at a carbon nanotube forest, which can be grown to microscopic structures, basically, you know, dimensions of several millimeters, Mm, and this contains aligned nanotubes in the vertical direction. If you, if you take a focused light beam and put it on the side of the forest uh, and try to locally heat the nanotubes there, so this is schematically what's your, what you're doing, um, you know, we, we, we expect carbon nanotubes to have high, high thermal conductivity. And again, like I said, it depends on the exact structure and so on. But basically you would expect something like this, that this heat will propagate along the direction of the nanotubes in the vertical direction but not much laterally. And um, so you would basically expect to see a, a hot strip going vertically. But what we see in practice is that that, that thermal conduction in, in the longitudinal or, or vertical direction is very strongly quenched. So if you take a photo of this, you see a strong incandescent glow of the, the region that has been illuminated, which basically tells you that that region is very hot and all the rest is relatively cold, in fact, very quickly gets to room temperature in the surroundings. And, and we call that a heat trap for, for obvious reasons. And um, so here are a few uh, interesting features of this effect. Um, because heat uh, conduction has been very strongly suppressed, you need very low, uh, relatively low um, input optical powers to reach very high temperatures. And when I say low, this is in comparison with bulk materials. If you want to heat a bulk metal to 2,000 degrees, you need, um, uh, you know, kilowatts uh, per square centimeter, maybe maybe hundreds of kilowatts per square centimeter of optical input. Um, here, you need three, uh, three orders of magnitude less. Um, and you can reach peak temperatures of 2,000 degrees, peak um, temperature gradients of several tens of degrees per micron. And this is happening on a conductor which actually emits electrons and allows the transport of electrons. So if you think about this, you are uh, seeing this material to, uh, that, that, that is confining heat while allowing electricity to flow, which is you know, the kind of thing we need for, uh, or we like for heat engines, right? And, and so it um, maybe opens up some opportunities for energy conversion and also um, uh, uh, creates room for more uh, physics research. Um, and uh, to make the connection to applications further, if you think about the, the wavelength of the input excitation, you know, if you put red or green or, or violet on it, um, they all get absorbed very well by the nanotube forest. And as you can see by this top graph here, if you combine these different wavelengths, basically the effect is all as if you're just increasing the power. So this is very good if you want to harvest something like sunlight, that's, that's broadband. And in fact, if you think about uh, some of the UV input, well, um, if, if, if you characterize um, the, the emission from this, you will see that there's not only the thermal effect, but then you also get the photoelectric effect. And in fact, you get multi-photon photoelectron emission that's uh, also augmented by thermal effects in all, all in this one material. So, so this could be very interesting for harvesting a broadband um, source of energy. And indeed here is a, a, a simple prototype device that we, we made uh, a while ago now um, that, that operates uh, with uh, sunlight uh, in a sealed off vacuum tube. So very small and compact device. And this is um, some examples of the, the current voltage characteristics showing the voltage, uh, the, the power generation uh, regime. Now, uh, I think to put it in, in, into a historic perspective, um, if we look back at the kind of things that NASA was making, um, you see basically the, the kind of uh, solar concentrator uh, that was being used, and, and you know, so this is a person here, get a sense of the scale. You needed a lot of input power to reach the kind of temperatures that you need for thermionic emission. And, and so now we are seeing that that nanomaterial in contrast allows us to make devices that are very compact that can be operated with a small uh, glass. And so uh, kind of uh, allows us maybe to think about uh, application domains and deployment in, in scenarios that, that would not otherwise be possible. We were uh, kind of confined to bulk materials. And um, so I, um, I, I just want to highlight maybe a little bit about the, the physics of this. And, and, and you know, this thermal confinement effect and related phenomena are very much topics that, that we're working on as, as far as 
you know, the basic physics are concerned. And uh, there could be various different um, phenomena happening there. Uh, and while we use carbon nanotubes as a prototype material system, uh, there's no reason to think that such phenomena cannot be replicated in other one-dimensional systems. And in fact, we've seen some, some examples of that in, in limited other materials. So there's a lot of room to work there. And uh, perhaps I'll, I'll just end by highlighting one way to think about the physics of this, which is if, if you think about the fact that all these nanotubes are, um, well, they each have conduction along the axis, but they also talk to each other through exchange of electrons and photons. And if you model this as a sort of anisotropic thermal flow with a temperature dependent thermal conductivity, you will, uh, you will see, for instance, that if, if you put the same optical beam on a, on a 3D material versus a 2D material versus a 1D material, you get a much higher temperature on the 1D material and with, um, with much more confinement. And, um, and, and for instance, if you wanted to see the effect of uh, these nanotubes uh, sort of talking to each other, like I said, through these different energy exchange mechanisms, you can model that and you see that as you put more and more nanotubes in the system, you get higher and higher temperatures. Uh, achieved with the same amount of uh, input power. So um, uh, with that, I'd like to conclude by saying that uh, I think there are um, a lot of things that nanomaterials uh, can offer us to, to, to create new um, heat engines, um, but we also do need to do a lot more fundamental research on them to understand uh, their optical, electronic, thermal, mechanical properties a lot better. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Anireza. And uh, okay, let, let's go uh, to the um, to the question uh, and answer a section. Okay, let me check if uh, there are uh, some questions. Okay, so uh, one question for uh, Giuseppe. Start, uh, let's start from Giuseppe. Um, how much OpenBTE uh, can be used uh, with with the large uh, servers in order to to to, to simulate uh, um, a material on uh, different scale length scales, uh, Giuseppe? Or okay. uh, uh, how, how much is uh, um, hardware uh, requesting? Let's say. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Uh... Can you hear me well now? Yes, with the uh, low intensity, but uh, OK, yes. OK, well, I need to fix this now. Yes. OK, yeah. all right. Yeah, uh, but, so, but, but more noisy. Oh, no, 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 OK, no, no, it's OK. okay. So, um, the, so the simulations I showed are have been carried out using a laptop that has of uh, four cores at eight threads. It is something that now can be purchased, you know, it, 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 it's, it's pretty accessible, I would say. So most of the simulations can be done a, a, a with your laptop, but not all of them. Some of them require, a, uh, let's say, a 32 core cluster in order to have a very finely tuned uh, simulation if you want to address very uh, little regions, fine regions in the in the in, in the form spectrum. Okay, but uh, uh, I would say uh, most of the simulations can be done on your laptop. Now, with the there's a new version coming up that's based on GPUs, and why not many laptops right now are equipped with NVIDIA GPUs? We can use the cloud. Uh, 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 cloud resources and Google Colab, for example, is offering free resources, free GPUs. And so we plan on further democratizing quantum transport simulations by rely relying on, on cloud simulation offered by services like Google Colab. Uh, one question uh, to um, Bruno. Um, could the, the, this hybrid concept uh, of thermoelectric and photovoltaic beat uh, the efficiency of solar cells with the optimized band gap? Well, um, the problem about um, um, hybrid, this kind of hybrid is that um, uh, silicon, which is the best uh, material in terms of, and also the, the most common material for thermoelectric, for solar cells is not suitable for thermoelectric uh, hybridization. So um, we think that uh, if there is a hope, it would be with perovskites. 
So perovskite hybrid with perovskites will be at least for um, the transition um, to help perovskite beat silicon. Okay. So because uh, wide gap materials right now cannot beat silicon. Okay. Uh, but because um, um, uh, maybe they, they would need more years in order to develop good quality materials and good uh, architectures. So, uh, symmetric hybrid with symmetric can help these materials to uh, uh, fill the gap in a shorter period of time. So they can make uh, they can make a wide uh, wide absorption more competitive in a shorter period of time. That's that's my understanding. And perovskite is um, for now uh, what we think is the best option. Uh, last question to Ali Reza. Uh, uh, okay, I appreciate very much the, 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 the idea of using one dimensional material uh, for uh, um, having a fermionic energy generator because in this case you don't need a, a lower functional material but you increase the, 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 the temperature. How much uh, the geometry of the converter can be uh, tailored in order to, to, to approach a larger area uh, uh, converter? So, so that's a, a, an interesting uh, question. And, and actually, maybe I should also make a comment about the uh, work function. Um, so that's interesting you, you said that. Um, you're quite right that you, know, you can get to high temperatures quite easily. And so maybe you don't worry about work function um, in, in the first step. But at the same time, when you go to high temperatures, uh, you increase thermal radiation greatly in terms of phono uh, photons. And so you could have a lot of loss, which then brings you back to saying, oh, I wish I could operate at lower temperatures with lower work functions so that I have less um, radiative loss. But on the other hand, uh, if we think about uh, engineering radiative coupling, especially in the near field, you know, along the lines of what, for instance, Andre was talking about, Mm, or, or, you know, along the lines of the, the, the general idea of nanostructuring, which, which you yourself uh, have been do uh, doing a lot of work on, uh, maybe, maybe we can really think of operating at high temperatures without that much uh, energy loss. So that's, that's, I think, something to be explored. Um, but in terms of the, the scalability of the geometry, uh, that's a good point. Um, in fact, what's interesting is that as you as you go to larger and larger spot sizes um, for the, the hot region, you, uh, the, the scaling of the power needed to get into that trapping uh, regime is not trivial. And it really depends on the details of the structure. And um, so in fact, at larger spot sizes, uh, you need a lower intensity, uh, so power per unit area. So, so it kind of lends itself quite well uh, from what we have seen, at least in this system to going to larger areas. Um, but the way I think about it also is that if you really wanted larger scale devices, you would probably have more of an array rather than one very large uh, sheet of material. And, and by the way, uh, you know, one also doesn't, as you see in that experiment that I showed, most of the forest is not doing anything. It's just the mechanical support. It's really a layer near the surface. So one can also think about using things like bucky paper and so on. Um, but of course, you have to have the, the sort of best quality material that you want for the application. So, so I think the, the geometry could be relatively diverse in terms of really matching the kind of scenarios you're trying to uh, explore. Thank you, Ali Reza. So we, we uh, finished the, 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 the sorry, third session. There are, there are yes. three questions now I saw on oh, the- sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, okay. So, no, no, I, I like, I like it very much because uh, uh, it means that uh, the, 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 the presentation were interesting and uh, stimulated the, 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 the audience. Okay. Uh, Last question for uh, uh, Bruno and one for uh, Ali Reza. Yes, uh, one to Bruno. Okay. In the, in the hybrid uh, photovoltaic thermoelectric converter, did you consider the power required for liquid cooling when calculating the efficiency gain? Yeah, of course, um, and I can tell you that um, f fortunately, fortunately, uh, the uh, power uh, request for uh, circulating the fluid is uh, 
just a very small fraction of the, pow the power that you have uh, with the uh, addition of the thermoelectric generator. Yeah, of course you have to consider that, but fortunately it's just, um, uh, especially for high concentration levels, you, uh, you can get uh, a nice number. So the power you need to circulate the fluid is not uh, changing too much uh, the output power you have, the, the power gain that you have. Another question to Bruno be, before Ali Reza. Yeah. Uh, what is your, your opinion, opinion about the chemical stability of the solar perovskites? Yeah, it's, I think it's a, a very uh, uh, interesting topic and is a, is a challenge right now. So, um, of course, uh, any kind of, uh, any, also any idea of doing a hybrid with perovskites have to consider the fact that uh, you need a stable perovskite at, at the beginning. <laughs> of course, it's, um, this is, was, um, uh, our hybrid uh, was uh, like uh, projecting the fact that uh, we will have soon a stable perovskite that we can hybridize with thermoelectrics. But of course, this is a, a, a problem right now, it's an issue. And a, a question, a curiosity uh, to Ali Reza. Uh, um, Antonio Scafuri says, I see a solar concentration application in your presentation. Uh, could, could you give us uh, more information about that? It is a normal standard or it is applied to permionic? Probably the, 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 the solar application you showed. Yeah, so, so the one that, uh, that I showed um, is Uh, that, that's specifically a thermionic uh, device. So, well, okay, so maybe I should backtrack. So the, the heating effect and electron emission can be used for any type of electron device. So we also have projects that, that involve basically electron beam system type of applications. But for this energy conversion, um, that uh, particular device was a thermionic device. Uh, we've also done some work on um, making essentially a thermoelectric device out of it, because again, you have a high temperature gradient on the conductor and that's useful for thermoelectrics. Um, we haven't published that, but I have a, a student's uh, thesis that that's available if someone is interested, but the focus is in the thermionics. Thank you very much. And so uh, we are uh, at the final discussion. I leave the floor to Gaspare Oh, for uh, some some uh, consideration statistics uh, i i have seen that uh, we we uh, almost uh, uh, about 100 people attended the, the, the continuously this uh, this uh, virtual right. colloquium yes, uh, sure. uh, Gaspari, uh, uh, yes i would like to give also comments about this colloquium but uh, okay so uh, we are actually so almost at the end of this event and then so in my opinion it was a great success i have to say because uh, we saw the participation of uh, outstanding researchers uh, in different fields of energy conversion. And also we had, uh, I have to say, a peak of uh, participants of about, uh, I would say external participants of about 80 uh, people, but including also all the speakers. 90, uh, 90. I, I at a certain moment, nine. it was also 90, okay. But yeah, 90. including also all of us, we are almost, uh, Uh, 100, as Daniela said. So, in my opinion, it was a, a great success, success also for the topics and um, and the talks of, of the of the speakers. So, just to give before giving you back the the, the floor, Daniela, just wanted to spend a very few words about the idea of this colloquium, which is also uh, at the basis, I would say, of the upcoming conference that will be held on July. So, uh, as probably some of you know, so I'm not really i have to say that i'm not really a big expert in this field because okay my most of my work was on magnetic materials but during the last four years i have the chance to work in the magenta project that was discussed during this uh, um, colloquium that was devoted exactly to the uh, to the uh, to combining you know two different uh, topics to combine uh, electro uh, Uh, ionic liquids, you know, with the magnetic nanoparticles for thermoelectric applications. So during this time, I had the chance, you know, to understand how interesting, but also how complex and how many alternatives are 
possible uh, for energy conversion. So, uh, so let me, for my experience, uh, I have to say that I'm really convinced that, that uh, as also, I think also Daniel more than me, that combining uh, different technologies, uh, but uh, also probably uh, taking also some contamination, I would say, from other uh, topic, other fields like magnetism can really lead, they can really open uh, to the development of novel devices, uh, also to more physics uh, research. And I really hope that this colloquium, let's say, uh, has led the uh, foundations, you know, to further work in, in this uh, direction. So this is my comments to this uh, colloquium. And then, so just uh, give me just few seconds more before giving the floor to, to Daniele. I would like to ask, actually, Andre is not here. So, but the idea is to take a, a picture, you say, a screenshot of all of us uh, before, but maybe we can wait a little bit for Andre and then uh, we can continue with uh, Daniele. When Andre will be here, we can take a, a screenshot of all of us. Uh, um, that's yeah. all, okay, thank you. A final consideration. I think that mm. uh, this event and also the, 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 the next conference will be the, the right opportunity for thermoelectric, uh, fermionic, uh, thermophotovoltaic, and uh, all and other uh, technologies uh, uh, based on hybridization of uh, thermal or, or solar energy converters can be um, contaminated and can, can be uh, hybridized uh, in order to, to, to make a community to speak and discuss and to uh, be able to prepare uh, future technologies uh, more efficient and uh, with a lower cost. Um, if we see uh, at the end of this event, we have extended a, a small wire from uh, across all the world because uh, we, we combined uh, competencies, know-how from USA, Canada, uh, China, Japan, uh, uh, all Europe. We, we also, also uh, some African uh, attendees that were, were attending. So I, I think that, that there's a, a very large interest in the, in the topic. So uh, I, I think that this could be a real extended community for, for inter, in, above all international community for, for, for future applications and future collaboration. This is my opinion uh, for now. And uh, okay, and uh, I, above all, I thank uh, you, Gaspari, as a uh, uh, chairman, I thank uh, the scientific committee and uh, above all, I thank uh, the speakers uh, which have uh, um, shared their, their uh, vision uh, at a, a very high level of, uh, uh, in terms of scientific point of view. And finally, I thank uh, the audience uh, uh, because it, uh, it, it has been a long event and uh, uh, maintaining the, 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 the attention very high because we, we think that we, we maintain the attention very high is uh, uh, a great goal for us. Okay, okay. Let, let's take a picture. The, the yes, picture. because uh, yes, uh, Andre, you was not here, but the idea is if you like, we would like to have a screenshot of all of us just uh, or to, to put on the website, just to remind all of us of this uh, nice colloquium. So, uh, Emanuele, can you take a picture of this? Tell us when it's okay, please. The, the technical direction is Emanuele. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, so let me just, uh, if you, uh, you like, uh, Daniela, would I just to show, not, not to show, would I just also to, maybe I can show the a couple of slides just to finish, but it, maybe it's not necessary. Just would I also, from my side, to thanks uh, all, uh, all the speakers for the valuable contributions. Uh, and, uh, of course, I would like to thank uh, Daniele and also the um, scientific uh, committee and especially the chair of the committee, Davide Pedis, for his... Uh, contribution. And then I would like to thank uh, uh, the um, IET uh, Southern Hub for uh, uh, that uh, has allowed uh, uh, 
uh, that made uh, that made this uh, this uh, event possible. Then I would like also to thank to thank uh, the Science School Association, in particular uh, Emanuele, for. Uh, uh, giving the technical support and of course it's already done by Daniela we'll to thanks all the participants for uh, this uh, uh, their active uh, participation as uh, Daniela said and uh, I don't have time to share just the last slide that is about uh, 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 the conference let's see if I able to to share sorry because I get some problem okay uh, yes, it is here. It just okay to remind all, just to invite all of you to this uh, next, uh, to the first conference about materials and technology for solar, thermal, electric energy conversion that will be held next year. So we really hope that by the end of uh, this year we can communicate, uh, uh, we can announce, we can uh, give you more information uh, concerning the registration fee and also the. Um, uh, the, the way how to submit to submit the abstract. So that's all from my side. I just uh, uh, no, I just would like to to stop sharing the screen. And uh, no, Daniele, if you want to say something else, no, okay. no, no, no. Uh, 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 guys, I uh, skipped how I have to submit my um, slides. Uh, I don't, I, it, I don't know if yes this could be useful this is all obviously extended to all the speakers yeah uh, but how to do that if you want yeah if you I, want. I can send if you want yes maybe yes, by by pdf you can send yes, it by, by pdf in order okay. in order to, to, to yes yeah, okay. yeah yeah i will send pdf so okay. i will send to you uh, um, Gaspare. Yes, it's okay. Also, Andre, please. What I what we need uh, also from other uh, speakers uh, is just uh, so we want to we re we recorded this uh, this event and then we want to make this event public. But we need the, yeah, the yeah, person of everybody. You know. No, no, I do not have any objection. Any, any. Okay, okay, it's okay. Absolutely. But please, please write it, uh, uh, Andre. Uh, only an email. Only an email. Yes, uh, Okay, so I do not have objections. Uh, okay, I will write it together with PDF files. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your efforts and it was uh, very interesting and uh, the, I hope that we did not exceed time too much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks to, I... to all, uh, for, for someone of us, uh, is morning, for uh, other uh, is afternoon, yeah. uh, for other is night. So yeah. we... we, we we unified the, 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 the world under uh, the okay the, bye the, bye guys <laughs> it was a pleasure thank bye. you bye. thank you bye 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 thank you bye, bye. 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 bye.